Telecommunication Union, and I have the privilege of introducing today's webinar. ITU is a UN specialized agency for ICTs, and we're also the organizers of AI for Good in partnership with 38 UN sister agencies and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and scale the solutions for global impact. We are pleased today to discuss open source accelerating AI innovation. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, but as always, we're counting on you, the participants, to help make this an engaging discussion. For this, we will be using the Q&A and chat functionalities, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our moderator today, Zhenbing Su, Open Source Evangelist at the Linux Foundation. Over to you, Zhenbing. Thanks, Ada. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to welcome you all to today. AI for Good webinar. Open source, let's reach AI innovations. This is today, <clears throat> I am the Linux Foundation Evangelist. It's a real pleasure to facilitate today's session, which is the second of the series of our, our four episode curated by the steering committee comprised by Yi Xu. The Executive Vice President, Chief Technology Officer, and the Chief Information Officer of ZTE, and Dot Govan, the Director of Pension Laboratory, and Abraham Haddad, the Executive Director of Linux AR and the Data Foundation. He will be the first speaker today. They have been received all works of our lives, like traveling, healthcare, and manufacturing. They are changed the view we look at the world. And uh, AI empowered the ability we recognize ourselves. Behind the success of AI, the development of open technology is the key driver of sustainable AI innovation. Why is open source so important to AI? And how can open source power AI? This is the question we are going to answer today. We have invited and eight experts dedicated themselves to open source practice. Some of the uh, partners in building open source system, and some are tech leaders from AI open source projects. They will share the state of art breakthroughs in their open source exploration. The first presentation will be given by Dr. Abraham. Dr. Abraham is vice president of Street Team Program at the Linux Foundation work with the largest technology companies and open source projects. In this role, he has focused on facilitating a weather neutral environment for adults the open source platform and the empowering generations of open source innovation, innovators by providing a neutral trusty hub for developer to code, manage, and scale open source technology. Albert leads the RF, AI, and data foundations that support and uh, sustain development. And the innovation in open source artifacts, architecture, and data has work and uh, the work, work of the RF, AI, and data at the whole support companies, developers, and the open source communities in, ident in identifying and contributing to AI and data projects that address the challenge of industry and the technology for the benefit of all participants. 
Now we come Abraham. We will give the microphone to Abraham. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to take one second uh, to share my screen with you. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Haddad, and I am the executive director of Aleph AI and data and my presentation today is focused on what we're doing in terms of accelerating development and innovation in the open source space with respect to ai and data as well <clears throat> so basically uh as a first uh introduction we are a non-profit organization we are based in the us however we are a global organization as part or as an umbrella foundation uh, under the linux foundation uh, and our members and communities are focused on supporting development uh, in open source projects, accelerating innovation, and creating new opportunities for everyone involved uh, in our efforts and in our projects. <laughs> and uh, our mission is very similar to any other mission hosted under the Linux uh, Foundation. Uh, you know, other umbrella foundations such as Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, Hyperledger Foundation. The automotive are great Linux, LF Edge, and many, many others. Uh, we all share the same mission. Our goal is to grow the open source communities, build com ecosystems around and with our projects, uh, and ensure uh, access to really awesome technology that companies and organizations can use in building their products and services. And each one of us, as an umbrella foundation, focuses on a specific technology sector. In our case, it's AI and data, and in many other cases, such as CNCF, it's cloud native computing, um, and so on. Um, so we are really uh, excited to be where we are today, given the uh, status of the foundation. Uh, I recognize many friendly names on um, the uh, list of presenters um, that are or were active with us in the past. Uh, so what you see in front of you on the screen is the list of projects that we host today in the foundation and this list is growing on a monthly basis um, so you may be able to recognize quite a few names there um, there are uh, about 33 or 34 different projects that we host today and as i mentioned this is growing by the month uh, we classify projects in three different categories we have on the top level as you can see on the chart the first row basically the graduated projects these are large-scale projects that have large communities around them with steady uh, commits and uh, really hyperactive development activities happening in these communities. And these projects have been tested, deployed uh, in large scale infrastructures and scenarios. Uh, following the graduated level of projects, we have a number of what we call incubation projects. These are uh, projects that are uh, in a growing phase. They're not yet ready for graduation, but they're working on ensuring uh, a steady um, a development of activities, uh, integrating with other projects and growing the developer community. And then um, the last row there is uh, what we call the sandbox projects. These are really great idea, uh, initial uh, proof of concept projects, and our goal is to support them to grow, to become incubation projects and drive to graduation. And when you look at our portfolio of projects, you will see that we touch on machine learning, we touch on deep learning, uh, training framework, standardizing uh, formats for models, uh, and uh, really a lot of projects in relation to um, uh, models and data and uh, trusted and responsible AI, um, and uh, several projects in relation to the actual compute aspect of dealing with AI and data loads. Uh, so this is just kind of a quick preview of our project. And I would encourage you, if you're listening to this uh, webinar and you are a maintainer or a creator or co-founder of an open source project that is under the AI or uh, data domains, uh, please reach out to us. We, um, we are really excited to talk to anyone who's uh, available to discuss with us hosting projects and growing that uh, open ecosystem of projects with open governance and integrating them with a number of other projects and supporting that growing ecosystem. Uh, 
so who are the companies hosting projects with us and supporting us with our mission from that perspective? We have uh, a number of tech companies, uh, as you can see on the screen, they are the who's who of tech in, um, in Asia, in China, in, in, in Korea, in India, uh, in Europe, of course, and then in North America. And um, there are really a variety of industries represented there, which is really something extremely healthy. And one interesting fact is that some of these organizations, they host more than one project. Uh, so for instance, IBM uh, up, went and joined LFA and Data as a board level member, and then they hosted the first project, and then they hosted the second project, and then the third project, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, similarly, Uber first, first hosted Orovod, and then they uh, we had really great success story with Orovod. Then Uber decided uh, to host Pyro with us, then we hosted Pyro and Pyro did really great. And then they moved to host more projects and so on. Uh, so it's really uh, a great story to tell about the efforts the foundation is doing in support of its project, uh, in support of the organization hosting the project and the various communities that we serve. We have had a very unprecedented momentum. Uh, today, we stand at 51 member organization that are formerly members of the foundation and mind Mind you that we started only as nine companies three years ago. Uh, we are hosting 34 projects. And when we first started, we only had a single project. Uh, we managed the IT infrastructure of all our projects and managed 35 uh, various GitHub organizations. Uh, we also managed the uh, legal aspects of all the projects that include compliance, that include trademark filing, export controls, uh, and uh, uh, many other um, uh, aspects of, of that nature. Uh, we support this project in growing their uh, ecosystem and in, in growing their developer community. And as an overall, across all 34 different projects, we count over 18,000 active developers in our project. This is really a major number considering uh, the number of projects we have. Uh, and this is really just a testament uh, to the efforts of the foundation in taking in uh, new projects uh, that are really small in terms of contributors, small in terms of companies and organizations backing these projects and growing them to become de facto leaders in their specific categories. And in addition to all of these different efforts and momentum we've been having, uh, we've been also able to launch various efforts across the past three years, touching on uh, interoperability across projects, uh, standardizing machine learning workflow, uh, trusted and responsible AI, uh, business intelligence uh, and AI. And as recently as about two months ago, we launched a new effort that focuses on data operations uh, and we call it data ops. And of course, everyone here is invited to participate in these various committees. Uh, we are an open foundation, so you can actually go to our website and look up information on these different efforts and add their Zoom calls to your agenda. And you can attend uh, and everything is open. There are no restrictions on who can attend and you can be part of this. So why organizations incubate projects with us? We offer really uh, a large suite of uh, supporting um, services for our projects. And as you may know, building ecosystem and building a sustainable uh, ecosystem requires really large and call really substantial amount of efforts. And you know that pretty really well, as Linux Foundation has been doing this type of work for almost you know, 15, 16 years now. Um, so we offer a neutral uh, hosting organization for our projects. We are um, resourced, so we have dedicated staff. So in the instance of uh, AI and data, LFA and data, there's myself, there's a program manager, we have a project coordinator and we have resources to support us with events, uh, resources to support us with marketing, resources to help us with uh, everything related to creative work. That means creating logos, websites for our project, formatting papers, et cetera. We have resources to create training and certification programs, uh, resources to help with IT infrastructures, cloud management, and so on. And this is really a huge benefit and one of our core uh, essential values for our projects. Um, in addition to all of that, we recently announced a new suite of services for our project uh, that we call LFX Platform. LFX Platform is really one of the, the best, not one of the, the best really developer platform out there that I've come across 
and it's a really an amazing place to get uh, really useful and insightful information about the development activities happening in projects. This is all available for our uh, projects. Uh, in addition to providing endorsement and mentorship by the tech community, which is technical body of LFA and data to our project and many other uh, helping uh, and supportive uh, initiatives. In terms of structure and governance, we have the uh, foundation governance, which is the governance of the LFA and data that consists of the governing board. Uh, and within the governing board, we have a number of committees that consists of legal committee, budget committee, uh, communication and marketing committee, we call it outreach committee, and of course, the strategy committee that focuses on the overall uh, strategy of the foundation. And then we have the technical coordination body, which we call the technical advisory council or TAC for short, and all technical initiatives and efforts happen under that tech body, TAC. That includes the various committees and all the technical uh, integration efforts and collaboration. In terms of members, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, have 51 member companies and you can see them on the screen. They are really a great mix of uh, tech companies, uh, of uh, organizations that are universities, nonprofit organizations. We have a number of, for instance, uh, nonprofit organization based in, in the UK, uh, Ethical AI Institute. We have um, the uh, Montreal AI Ethical Institute in Canada. We have uh, you know, large universities, New York University, we have Rice University and many others. And of course, you can, um, you, know, you can look at the chart and recognize the various organizations that are spread across all geographies. So we have companies that are members in Asia, in, in Europe, North America, uh, and really a great mix of uh, backgrounds uh, and, foc and focused industries. Uh, so, I'm going to reset a little bit and talk generally about the ecosystem. Uh, as you know, open source is really a great equalizer in the sense that it offers access uh, or equal access uh, to source code and lower health lowering bar to, to any given domain. That's AI, that can be data, that can be cloud native computing, uh, edge computing, or any other domain. Uh, and this is really what you call a two way street where organizations and individuals uh, participate and benefit from these different projects, but at the same time, they also come back and contribute to this project, helping grow this project uh, and uh, make them essential in that part of ecosystem. And when we look at the AI and data ecosystem, as you can see on the screen, um, we can uh, see that there are really hundreds of open source AI and data projects that are extremely successful. And this landscape uh, is actually accessible via the web. The uh, link is on the website is on the slide and you can explore it uh, because it is actually interactive. And we capture all the top projects. So we have about 315 projects captured on this chart. And uh, as you can notice, it's all categorized in different major categories as machine learning, deep learning, um, trusted AI, security, uh, net notebook environments, and so on. And within each category, we have subcategories. So if you took a look, if you look at the top left, uh, under machine learning, for example, we have frameworks, platforms, libraries, and MLOps. Um, so there's really a lot of projects, a uh, very complex ecosystem, and very complex relationships between these different projects. Uh, and the collection of all these projects uh, presents over 40,000 active developers that are contributing code. Uh, there are over 140 uh, companies that founded these different projects because in many instances uh, a company can found more than one project and more than 10 universities i believe 11 universities that were founders of projects that are on the landscape and collectively these projects constitute over 450 million lines of code and this is increasing by the rate of one new million line of code almost every single week so you can imagine the rapid pace of development happening in this ecosystem. However, there are still some challenges. It's a growing ecosystem, a lot of organizations, over 40,000 developers, over 300 strong, really active projects, but 
with challenges. And these challenges cover various areas. Uh, there's challenges in respect to fragmentation, lack of integration across different projects. Uh, there are challenges with relation to governance, you know, who governs the project, who makes a decision on each project. A lot of projects don't have governance. Those who have may not uh, have uh, a fair governance where the governance sometimes tilts in support of the founder of the project uh, or the governance is not documented and so on. There are challenges in relation to the origins of the project and its ability to compete in very crowded space. And of course, once a project is able to overcome these different challenges, there is a challenge of managing the project assets. So when you have a project with many organizations active in it, uh, you know, who's going to pay for the testing, uh, for the cloud testing? Who's going to pay for the website development? You know, who's going to decide on the roadmap? Uh, who's going to pay for the trademark and manage it? Who's going to do the compliance filing? Who's going to do the, I'm sorry, the export control filing? Who's going to run the compliance scan? Who's going to fix the compliance issues, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these together create kind of a glass ceiling for adoptions. So when organizations out there are looking at the ecosystem, uh, looking to invest and adopt a project or projects for their products and services, they always tend to prefer a project hosted in a foundation under neutral governance, uh, a project that has a fair governance that uh, makes it clear on how to become a maintainer on the project, uh, how to become a committer, how to become part of the technical steering committee of the project and influence the direction of the project, uh, makes it uh, a lot, a lot easier for organizations to make a decision and proceed with a project that is able to overcome these different challenges. And this is really how LFAI and data came about about three years ago, where uh, initial members that are members of the X Foundation got together and decided to start that effort uh, in support of this ecosystem. And today, three years later, we actually support over 10% of the ecosystem's key projects. So you can see on the screen the landscape, but only featuring LFAI and data project. And this is really uh, a great chart that illustrates our growth because we started with only one project on the slide. Uh, and today we cover a lot of these areas and our goal over the next year is to be able to have one foundation sponsored and hosted project in each of the missing categories. So that if you're an organization from the outside, looking into the ecosystem, you don't have to be a technology company. You can be a transportation company. You can be a company in healthcare or in finance and looking to build up your AI stack or looking to infuse your, your software stack with AI and machine learning. Uh, then you can look at our landscape and figure out what projects are in support of your mission and adopt projects that have a fair governance and you can rest assured that this project is going to be here in a year, it's going to be here in three years and in five years, regardless to what happens to the founder of the project. And the project will always have its legal assets safe in a nonprofit organization uh, and managed by professional staff. Uh, in terms of developer community, uh, we've had really great growth in 2020. Uh, we, in 2020, we had over 8,000 contributors who com committed over 100,000 commits. These are actual code building. Uh, and uh, in 2021, we're actually doing double digit growth. Uh, so we went from um, almost 9,000 contributors uh, in 2020 to today, we are at a little over 18,000 uh, and a half and 500 contributors. Actually, I just checked the updated stats uh, just before this call, and we're at uh, about 18.6 thousand uh, active contributor uh, to these various projects uh, that delivered over 354 thousand commits uh, contributions, uh, including about 150 thousand commits. This is really massive. I mean, if you look at the development rate, uh, it's really incredible how fast development uh, is going. And part of that is we were able to take out all the overhead of these projects. So projects don't need to think, and project members, you know, developers and engineers and scientists, they don't need to sit and worry about creating an event or who's going to manage and pay for our website and for our uh, GPU testing with Amazon or, you know, who's going to do the compliance scan, who's going to worry about the export control filing. All of that infrastructure plumbing 
has been taken out and engineers and scientists will only need to focus on innovating and developing and, and pushing the project forward. And we as a foundation were able to manage all that infrastructure and that quote unquote plumbing for them, having them completely dedicated to just innovation and development. And we have a lot of activities uh, focused on developer and uh, marketing efforts. Uh, as you can see, we've done a lot of announcements in 2019. We've almost doubled the number of announcements in 2020. And we are on the same path in 2021. We do a lot of promotion for projects in terms of events, project graduation, new project joinings, project promotion from incubation to graduation or sandbox to incubation, uh, cross-project uh, collaboration. So there's a lot of promotion for the project within the foundation and towards the global community of tech. And in addition to that, we bring communities together via our events. Uh, we've hosted six events in 2016. We've done eight events in 2020. We've done so far six events in 2021. And I think between now and the end of the year, we have three or four additional events. Uh, some of them are specific to a project and some of them are large scale events. In addition to all of that, we also team up with Linux Foundation to host a uh, larger event such as uh, having a three-day summit called LFAI and Data Summit, or having an AI and data track at KubeCon and uh, a AI uh, event with uh, the CNCF that we call Kubernetes and AI and many other events. So uh, our communities love that, our project love it. It's a great way to meet other people, uh, connect with other projects and discuss opportunities for collaboration. Uh, and uh, this chart and the next chart are actually created by uh, Jim Sporer, who's actually on the call as well. Uh, and uh, Jim was actually the chair of our TAC committee. And uh, he was thinking of ways to present uh, these different projects in terms of growth. Uh, and this is really a great representation. And thank you, Jim, for this, because I continue to use the slides. Uh, so this is uh, this slide is a bit old. Uh, it's a due representation of the actual code back then. However, it tends to in what it tries to communicate, uh, regardless of what's on the slide. So the idea is uh, this: you know, on the x-axis we have the number of commits. The y-axis is the number of line. And the idea is most of the projects come to us in the bottom left corner. You know, very little commits, very little code happening. And this is very natural when new projects are started. And our goal as the foundation is to take this project and take them through up all the way up to the most right topest quadrants on the chart where we have really crazy amount of commits happening to the project and a lot of growth in terms of lines of code. And very similar, uh, if you look at the number of contributors on the X axis, and the number of GitHub stars. We want to increase the number of contributors in our project and increase their uh, GitHub stars. And how do we do that? We help this project. And our goal is to take all these projects and take them all the way up to the most right top corner. And this is really the journey of our project. A lot of the projects join us at incubation or sandbox category. They're small projects. Some of them are really just a proof of concept and we work with them. We support their operation. We provide them resources at the different uh, services I've mentioned earlier. We provide collaboration opportunities and integration opportunities with other projects, visibility in the industry through our events. And they gradually start being promoted internally by themselves, growing their developer community and going to that uh, successful, uh, most successful top right corner. So in terms of challenges and trends, there are definitely a lot of challenges in the industry. Hiring talent is to be uh, a major challenge. Uh, you can ask any hiring manager trying to hire for AI or data, and they will mention this to you. Uh, computational power is an ongoing challenge. Um, <clears throat> every time there's a breakthrough in terms of computational power, we realize that, hey, that was great, but we still need, need more power. Uh, and this really drives a lot of opportunities that I will uh, mention uh, in a later slide. Uh, building trust is critical. Um, consumers and people will not really use products and services that integrate AI if they don't trust the AI in it. And this actually created uh, kind of a new uh, area of research uh, that covers fairness, uh, that covers trust trustable and uh, responsible AI. 
Uh, and the goal is really how can we solve these different issues and present products uh, that use AI as kind of trustable product that respect the privacy, uh, that um, respect um, the specific data provided by the users that were um, um, provided data basically to, to turn different models and so on. Uh, data privacy, security, and governance. Uh, this is really um, one of the top challenges. Uh, there are even initiatives at country levels and, for instance, at national at and international levels. You know, the United Nations have different efforts in the space. Uh, the EU as a unit has different efforts. Uh, and there are multiple uh, national or, or local slash country level uh, initiatives targeting uh, these different areas. Um, in addition to national policies and different legislation passed in different countries that target uh, the specific use of AI. Uh, and even some countries went above and beyond by creating even uh, you know, specific uh, minister uh, for AI or even uh, chief AI uh, officer for the country uh, with an office dedicated to uh, overlooking and thinking and coming up with solutions and sponsoring and supporting and providing grants to different projects in enablement of solutions at the target these different challenges. And um, really one of the critical challenges there uh, is reaching human level intelligence. Uh, and there are a lot of um, kind of advocates out there um, kind of evangelizing that AI is uh, close to getting to human level intelligence. And I think we're quite a bit far from that perspective. Um, and you know, for a lot of people, this is a challenge and we need to kind of improve our technologies to get to that level. So all of these different challenges actually create opportunities and drive trends uh, with respect to AI and data. Uh, trust and responsible AI is really a booming uh, effort, uh, not within the foundation, but just globally, a lot of companies uh, and other uh, nonprofit organizations are really focused on this topic. Um, deriving value and insight in data, you know, companies, uh, organizations really are able to gather insane amount of data. I mean, think of just a simple example, mobile operators. You know, some countries have mobile operators that have, you know, 200, 300 million subscribers. Other countries have, you know, over a billion subscribers. So think of the amount of data, just, just this example uh, of, of a company is able to gather. Uh, so data is not the issue at this point. We have the data and the challenge and the opportunity really lies in you know, taking this data and looking in it for insights uh, and deriving value from it. Otherwise, what's the value of it, right? Uh, AI and edge computing, this is very hot um, opportunity now and a lot of execution happening in the space. Uh, even if you look at our sister foundation, LF Edge, they're also exploring uh, infusing AI with a lot of the work they're doing. And the idea is a lot of the real-time processing is moving to the edge. Uh, edge meaning you know, your, your TV, your uh, fridge, smart fridge, my cell phone, your setup box, and so on, your car. And with that, a lot of the AI is moving to the edge, and we need really uh, uh, processing power at, at the edge to be able to do a lot of those computational power and not to be done at a, like a, uh, at a, a data center somewhere and transfer to the, to the edge. It's going to be done at the edge, how to do that. Um, and a lot of these different challenges uh, that I mentioned earlier also uh, put emphasis on specialization in chip design. So you will see a lot of uh, AI on chip type uh, designs and implementation that are happening today. And this is driving really kind of a new era in chip design uh, and manufacturing. Uh, of course, efficient and smart algorithm. I think this will be uh, a, a kind of a standard opportunity and a standard challenge uh, going forward, probably for the next 34 years. In addition to all of that, federated learning. Uh, this is really a new approach uh, that allows to maintain privacy while sharing and training with uh, models with sensitive uh, data. And in the foundation, you actually host a couple of projects that focus on federated learning. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this is really a fascinating uh, uh, ecosystem to be working in. Uh, open source in general, it's just an amazing place to be. Uh, and when you, we look at open source, one of the fastest growing and, and really where a lot of uh, investments are happening, a lot of new startups are being created, a lot of developers are focusing their time, a lot of companies are creating new projects, participating in projects, and collaborating with others is actually AI and data. 
Uh, so I would uh, like to join you to become a member with LFAI and data and be part of this transformation uh, and also invite you to incubate your project with us and be part of our uh, growing fund. Uh, thank you for our host today, ITU, in collaboration with the United Nations uh, for the sponsors and the uh, uh, team that put together this event. And I will uh, pass it back to you, to the host uh, if there are uh, uh, time for questions. Otherwise, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, my email is my first name, Ibrahim at phoenixfoundation.org. Thank you. Thanks, Akbar, for the great representation. Uh, there are some questions from Akhtate. Oh, anyway. If there are no questions, uh, again, thanks, uh, Akbar, for your uh, Bring so much information about LFA and update. Uh, so let's move to the move to our next speaker, and I'm happy to welcome Jamie Sofer. Jamie served on the EZIP board of director at IBM and did open source and AI data. Global unit Global University programs, IBM AI maintenance service research, and uh, IBM Venture Capital Relationship Group. At Apple, he achieved the Distinguished Engineer Scientist Technology for authoring and learning platform. After graduating from MIT, he developed a speech recognition system at uh, Verbex, then got a Yellow PhD of AI with, with all, over 90 publication, publications and nine patents award, include AMA Substack, Christopher Nadlock career contributions to the service discipline, Everett Gamerson service research. Wild Notch Service Dominate Logic, Dynamic Service System, and uh, Pigmat Fellow for Advanced Service Scientist. Now let's give us the microphone to Jim. Welcome, Jim. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Let me just bring up my slides. Uh, and I put in the chat the link to my slides. So if anybody wants them, uh, they're online. Uh, thanks very much for this opportunity. I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, if you need to contact me, uh, my contact information is here. I want to thank the organizers and especially Leah for this opportunity to present to you a little bit about the future of AI today. And ISIP, the International Society of Service Innovation Professionals, is a nonprofit member of the LFAI. As uh, Ibrahim showed that chart of all the, the members, ISIP is, uh, is one of the nonprofit members of LFAI and data. Uh, about eight hours from now, uh, an example of one of the uh, open source projects, one of the important open source projects that's part of LFAI and data uh, is having a community meeting. It's an LFAI and data day, eight hours, just eight hours from now, uh, Onyx community virtual meetup. There's still time to register if uh, people would like to, uh, to take part in that. And uh, as Ibrahim said, LFAI and data provides tremendous support, uh, marketing support, uh, all kinds of uh, support for the Onyx community. Uh, the Onyx community, of course, includes um, the steering committee members, include uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Intel, NVIDIA, IBM. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really important project 
uh, in this uh, open source community. And if you do have an open source project, uh, I really urge you to uh, contact Ibrahim and uh, number one, get it into the LFAI and data landscape if it's not there. But number two, think about hosting it with LFAI and data uh, for um, accelerating the progress uh, with your uh, open source project. So my talk today, I'm going to briefly talk about trusted AI and how that will usher in a golden age of service. And um, I think we're all aware of the, you know, the pandemic has accelerated the um, accelerated the digital transformation of society. You know, education's gone online, healthcare's gone online with virtual doctors' appointments and retail. You know, overnight delivery. Um, certainly, the pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation of society. But um, I really like the opening video for AI for Good, where it showed AI having this very positive effect on society. I'm also very optimistic that uh, trusted AI will usher in this golden age of, of service. However, uh, Abraham also showed the challenges, and some of the challenges are computation, uh, when will AI achieve human level, uh, that's not going to be for a while, um, and so I'll show some uh, roadmaps about when you can expect certain types of capabilities to be available in AI. And finally, I'll end with a slide uh, on the best way to predict the future. So. Um, who I am, I think you heard my bio, but uh, and also Ibrahim mentioned, um, I've been at uh, IBM the last 22 years. I just actually retired from IBM uh, to work on my next book, which is uh, uh, Service in the AI Era and uh, at izip.org. And um, uh, I was the TAC chair um, for LFAI and data, as Ibrahim mentioned last year, uh, also on the Onyx Steering Committee. So I'm quite familiar with LFAI and data and uh, happy to uh, give advice about moving projects to LFAI and data if that's helpful. The two things that I study are artificial intelligence and something called service science. And both of them depend on trust. Uh, you can't have good service if you don't have trust and collaboration. And artificial intelligence won't be adopted if it's not secure and fair and explainable. So trust is really the key thing that I think we, uh, to get the AI for good, we are going to have to ensure uh, that we increase the levels of trust in society, and that's certainly a challenge. Um, so let's jump into it. So how do we predict the future of artificial intelligence? Well, um, this, this chart right here is a fairly complex chart, but it's, it's basically my version of Moore's Law. And you can see from 1960, 1980, every 20 years, across the uh, horizontal out to 2080, um, every 20 years, uh, computing costs are down by a factor of 1,000. So I remember in the 1960s when IBM mainframes were able to do just 1,000 instructions per second. And in the 1960s, that was fast. But today, for $1,000 in this uh, up here, you can see it goes from a dollar to a thousand dollars, a million dollars, a billion dollars, a trillion dollars. Uh, for a thousand dollars today, it's easy to get a terascale. A terascale computing uh, is uh, a million million instructions per second. So now I ask the question: What's the computing power of a human brain? The best estimates are that it's about an exascale or a billion billion instructions per second. And you can see these diagonals here. This is Moore's Law. So every 20 years, it drops uh, by 1,000. And uh, to get to an exascale at $1,000 doesn't happen until 2060. So if people ask me, hey, Jim, when will we have 
uh, human level AI and, and not just like running maybe on one supercomputer somewhere in the world, but when will it be uh, distributed throughout society economically? It's really when we get to an exascale at $1,000, which uh, again, doesn't happen till about 2060. So that's 40 years away. So I think we've got 40 years to um, uh, get the computing power that we need to distribute AI uh, fairly around the world, make sure there's, uh, you know, it's not just being used by the large corporations or large governments that can afford it, but it's something that's democratized and it's available uh, for all happens around 2060. And you can see, um, uh, you know, and this depends on Moore's law continuing. So all of these uh, data points uh, before 2020, you know, these are you can just look these up, and it's amazing how uh, accurate these predictions have been of Moore's law. Um, but as we go into the future, of course, uh, we're less certain that Moore's law will continue. But even if Moore's law slows down a little, it would just push out the exascale at $1,000 maybe to, uh, to 2080. Um, there's a lot of concern about artificial intelligence, I think to get to trust, we have to deal with the concerns. And some people see the, the cost of a digital worker going down, according to Moore's law. And you can see, um, you know, the cost of a digital worker crossing the person's average annual salary here. And a lot of people worry about, you know, AI taking away jobs. But I'm not so worried about that because, as you can see on the next slide here, um, you know, I'm, I live in Silicon Valley where there's a lot of entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs look at GDP per employee. So if you're trying to do a startup and you have to hire a data scientist or an AI expert, uh, the cost of a digital worker going down is great news because you're going to be able to uh, do more startups. And this is reflected in the increasing exponential of GDP per employee in the US. So one way we can predict the future of artificial intelligence is just to look at the computing power of the human brain. All our brains are about an exascale, a billion, billion instructions per second. And when can we expect to get a billion, billion instructions per second at about $1,000 in these graphs here? Um, indicate uh, my estimate based on Moore's law continuing. Now, the next way we can predict the future of artificial intelligence is by looking at something called leaderboards. Leaderboards are just a ranking of who's best at a particular capability. And if you're not familiar with it, I recommend you take a look at paperswithcode.com SOTA, which stands for state of the art. If you go here, you know, every week there's new papers about progress and artificial intelligence. You know, um, uh, NVIDIA and Microsoft just came out with their paper on Megatron Turing, you know, the largest uh, uh, network that's been trained up so far uh, for natural language processing. But if we look at these leaderboards, we can see when do they reach human level capability. So certainly for pattern recognition, for speech recognition, image recognition, even language translation, um, for a couple of years, we've had systems that for particular tasks, you know, very precisely defined tasks, the AI is better than human level capability for these pattern recognition problems. And certainly you're all familiar with you know, when IBM came up with uh, Deep Blue, uh, you know, for chess playing in 1997, we had an AI that was better at uh, playing chess than the world's expert. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, there's AlphaGo and AlphaZero, of course, now even more advanced capabilities. But, but it's interesting to look at leaderboards and try to estimate, you know, their current error rates and when will it be uh, higher than human level and we can see we're still in this kind of perceived world level of AI. 
you know, making predictions and doing pattern recognition. We don't really have very good AI for um, human-like memory, uh, episodic memory, or human-like reasoning, common sense reasoning. And these systems, um, I expect we'll have by 2027, some pretty good common sense reasoning systems. And, and common sense reasoning is different in, in China versus the US versus Europe. Uh, common sense reasoning has to do with your culture. So a very, very complex problem. Probably we don't get to human level capabilities until about 2027. Now certainly, if you look at some specific things like no human can memorize Wikipedia, but that's what IBM used when we did our Watson Jeopardy solution. That was a uh, system that basically had all of Wikipedia. But human-like memory is different. It does generalizations. It uh, has remindings. It has an ability to do explanations. So we don't get really uh, human-like cognition until about 2027 if you look at the leaderboards. Um, and then the next thing, once you can do uh, you have a, an AI with a human-like memory and common sense reasoning, then it can start building relationships. It can start doing social interactions and having fluent conversations. And chatbots are not fluent conversation. And, you know, if you've got a pet dog, your, your pet dog has better social interaction skills than any AI system in the world. So we don't really get to these social interactions, fluent conversations till around 2030, 2033, based on, again, on the leaderboards. And if you look at the rate of progress, when will we get to human level capabilities? And of course, you know, what we all want is, uh, you know, AI that can be an assistant or a collaborator or even a coach or a mediator. When, when will AI be able to fill roles in business and society? Uh, like a person can. And even for very, very specialized tasks, we don't see that happening, you know, fully till about 2036 to 2039, almost 20, 2040. So, you know, two decades away from this. And, and, you know, some of the leaderboards that we look at for like a collaborator, a collaborator, you know, the best collaborators I've had, you know, I argued with them and debated with them constantly. So if you look at the debating uh, leaderboards. When will we have debating technology that's um, generally as good as uh, as a human? Uh, and also, you know, for a coach, um, you know, we, you know, when will an AI be able to be a really good coach for us? We can look at some of these uh, these other leaderboards. And and what is a mediator? Well, a mediator is you can think of that as an AI that you would trust to make decisions on your behalf. And who do you trust to make decisions on your behalf today? Some people say, nobody but me. Other people say, well, I trust my parents to make decisions on my behalf, or I trust my wife. She was, she was at Yale Law, so she's a better negotiator than I am. But you can look at, there's leaderboards for negotiation, and you can see when will they be at human level, probably, again, not till you know, the late 2030s. So again, AI is very overhyped. So, you know, if you believe what you read in the newspapers, you'd think, oh, we're on the verge of AI that's human level. Well, no, it's going to be decades uh, based on just looking at Moore's law for the democratization and looking at these leaderboards. You can, you can get a better accurate, more accurate estimate of when uh, certain capabilities will be coming in artificial intelligence. Now, I just want to end with uh, a couple thoughts on the best way to predict the future. And I've always, uh, Alan Kay was my mentor while I was at Apple, and he was always fond of saying the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Um, my variation of Alan Kay's slogan is the best way to predict the future is to inspire the next generation of students to build it better. And I think we're, you know, uh, you know, I'm in retirement. I'm 65 years old, so I'm kind of like at the end of my career. But, oh, wouldn't it be exciting to be at the beginning of your career right now? Because 
you know, if you're in your 20s or even your 30s, you know, two decades from now, when you're at kind of your peak in your your career, uh, all of these predictions for artificial intelligence will probably be here. So, you know, you're, you know, if you're in your 20s or 30s, um, you know, you're going to see in another decade cars driving themselves. And a lot of the biggest challenges here are regulatory. Uh, by 20, you know, 30, 35, no water shortages. Singapore already recycles, you know, 99% of its water. Uh, manufacturing is local again because of rod- robotics and 3D printing. Um, energy, no energy shortages. There's three technologies that by 2035 should be able to provide uh, all the energy uh, the world needs out to about 2060. Um, the Broad Group in China can build 30-story buildings in 15 days. If you haven't watched the video, it's pretty amazing. Uh, by 2035, by 2040, we're getting close to these uh, capabilities I've just been describing uh, for artificial intelligence. Retail goes social, finance goes crowdfunded, healthcare, all robotic surgery, 3D printed organs by around 2040. Uh, education is totally transformed. It looks more like a team sport. When you have young children that have a smartphone, you know, and all your apps have grown up to be artificially intelligent, um, even children will be able to um, uh, make, you know, be citizen scientists and make discoveries. Uh, and I know I lose a little bit of credibility when I say this, but I predict by about 2035, 2040, I'm very optimistic on AI for good for government. And I think government even works better. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'm starting to see, I think, some questions in the chat. Um, I'll take some questions now. And I do want to mention, if you go out to uh, SlideShare and get my deck, slideshare.net slash four, there's a bunch of backup slides that you might find interesting. So uh, definitely check out the slides that are online. And I see a question for me, uh, Reinhard Scholl. Um, uh, what are your thoughts regarding bringing data literacy to high school kids? Uh, what would be the right age? Uh, what would have to be given up instead of the curriculum, calculus, geometry, et cetera? Um, great question. Um, I was just talking to uh, a colleague at Amazon this morning uh, who's on the Onyx Steering Committee, uh, and he was teaching his uh, five-year-olds about data science. So I don't think you can start too young. Um, I think... Um, Data science uh, can certainly be integrated into any curriculum. I mean, data science is like statistics, right? Um, it's just mathematics, statistics, but, you know, the new twist is, of course, you're building uh, AI models. So I think, you know, statistics and data can be taught in any context. So I think you don't really have to give up anything. You just have to revise the curriculum to include um you know, uh, new ways of, new types of activities and new ways of looking at it. I, I do think it should be taught in uh, as early as possible that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I believe children at a very early age could start learning, you know, how to use data to improve their day-to-day life, right? Um, how do you use data to um, make better decisions that, you know, even children have to make decisions. And um, I think, you know, the more we can demonstrate how to use data to make better decisions, that that's going to be important. And, um, you know, how do you plan your day? Like, how much time do you spend in different types of activities? Um, all of that is an opportunity to start using data science to get better results um, from our activities. Um, there, a little 
bit longer answer is I do believe there could be a Moore's law of education in the AI era. And what I mean by that is um, I think even things that have been taught the same way for many, many years, like you mentioned geometry and calculus here, I do think even in, in every area, we should be looking for innovations in how we teach calculus, how we teach geometry to make it more relevant to the current generation. And I think that's, a, that's an innovation skill that we can get better at and we can become more data driven. And I think AI can help us. AI for good can help us with that. So Reinhard, um, you know, great question. Those are a few stabs in the dark thoughts of my perspective on it. And thanks for asking the question. And I'm probably out of time now, but let me just check. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm right at the end of my, my session. But if there's any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm just uh, spore at gmail.com. If you join LFAI and data Slack, I'm on LFAI and data Slack. You can reach me there. Um, and uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so reach out to connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to uh, ask me some more questions. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I've got some presentations on SlideShare that talk about a Moore's Law for education and, and show how it might actually work. Um, so uh, definitely look for for Moore's Law Education. Maybe you'll find something on Google that would be intriguing to you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. Hey, Tim. Here is the last question uh, from Lin Wei at uh, Flavor Tech. Uh, he asked, uh, what is your opinion about uh, brain computer interface? Is it one of the trend of AR technologies? Um, yeah, so inference is, uh, you know, deduction. You can say deduction, that's kind of a type of inference. And, and for solving certain types of optimization problems, you know, we can solve, you know, 100 million variables, you know, in the blink of an eye. So there's, there's certain types of things that computers are very, very good at. But inference like you and I, human-like inference, computers are still very, very bad at it. Um, there's some, you know, even with the, the Megatron Turing thing, you know, they, they, they have like common sense, like this is progress towards common sense. And there's, there's a few leaderboards. There's uh, uh, the Winograd uh, leaderboard on common sense reasoning. And I think the Megatron was scoring around 60 or 70 percent on some of those, maybe a little bit higher. Um, but people, of course, are, are, are much better at those. Um, I think human-like inference depends fundamentally on a human-like memory system, a human-like episodic memory system. And there's no AI system in the world not at Amazon, not at IBM, not at Google. Nobody's got a human-like episodic memory system in an AI system today. Uh, in fact, if you look at, there's, there's a lot of jokes about how dumb Siri is and how dumb Alexa is because, you know, they don't have a memory that works the way our human-like memory works. So I think we're, you know, we're really, when we talk about inference, we have to be careful. Uh, Gary Marcus has written some nice uh, things. Um, um, uh, his partner, uh, Davis, here at NYU, has written some really nice things about uh, how hard inference is if you want to do human-like inference. So, so I hope those pointers are helpful. So there's some things computers are very good at inference-wise. But in terms of human-like inference for common sense reasoning, long decades, decade or more uh, to get to where uh, uh, human capability is. Okay, thanks, Jim. 
uh, for the topic on the future of AI and uh, address the challenge and uh, the roadmap. Uh, so we are uh, move to the four next topic, and I have question you can input in the message box. Uh, so the, the next speak will be held by uh, Li Ya Yuan. Uh, Li Ya is the open source and uh, Li Ya is the open source uh, and the standard decision engineer in ZTE. Focus on the field of AI for telecommunication network. She is currently the Technical Steering Committee Chair of AI Project Adlik. You can be paid in LFAI Data Foundation. She also takes an active part in ITUT standard activity and serves as Work Group 3 Chair in ITUT Autonomous Network Focus Group. Okay, we are give the microphone to Lia. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jim Bing, for your great introduction. And uh, thanks, Jim and, and Abraham, give us so many great high level uh, insight and now I'm going to go down and bring you some details of the open source projects. Now today I'm going to introduce a project called Adlik, and uh, I will tell you how it makes AI more accessible. And before we talk about Adlik, let's take a look at uh, uh, a typical pipeline of AI applications. First, you need to do the training. You get the data from your business scenarios and you collect them and uh, you select the uh, se select features and do the forward and back backward propagation. And finally, you will get a model with a great uh, accuracy rate and uh, uh, which will meet your accuracy requirements. And then you can go to the inference stage. You get the uh, data that you need to do the prediction. And finally, you get, a, uh, get an output. And in this whole process, I think there may be some challenges we may face. The first one is the model compiling, which is um, um, between the training and the inference, we can, we can um, see that uh, um, AI engineers tend to use different frameworks during their training stage, like TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch. And the models need to be uh, deployed on various hardware environments like CPU, GPU, and even NPU considering our um, various uh, business scenarios. Of course, we cannot directly use the models that was directly trained from the training frameworks, but there are also still many uh, inference frameworks for us to choose. Which one is the best one? Which one is the correct one? That's hard to say. So this is the first uh, challenge. And the second challenge lies in the um, inference performance. You see for different uh, scenarios, you have different inference performance requirements like the latency or the throughput. And there is also a lot of hard work to do. You need to do the tuning, you need to do the optimization. That's what we want to simplify. And that's why uh, we have our um, project incubated that's called Adlik. It is the uh, toolkit for accelerating deep learning inference on specific hardware. It integrates several well-adopted solutions, including TF Lite, TensorRT, OpenVINO. And uh, uh, so uh, you can deploy the models to any um, platforms you'd like with, uh, uh, with great uh, efficiency. And it will be much flexible and, uh, uh, and quick. And since Adlik provide a universal entrance, so if you want to uh, migrate your model from one hardware to another, it will be very convenient. And if you have, if you want to integrate another 
inference framework, you can also do it very quickly. And after you deploy the model on a specific hardware, uh, these models it will be able to run more efficiently to meet the inference um, performance requirements like latency and throughput in different uh, scenarios. You do not need to do the tedious tuning work. All of this will be done by Adelic. And uh, here is the landscape of LFAI and data. Uh, just now, Abraham just uh, gave a broad view of it. And uh, now we can see uh, Adelic more clearly in the inference toolkit. And here is the architecture of Adelic. It's also a pipeline, pipeline of how Adelic works. First, we have the graph optimizer. Here we integrate several, to, uh, several tools like pruning, quantization, and the structural compression, which enables us to do the model optimization and uh, compress the models without sacrificing the accuracy. And after that, the big model will become much smaller. And then we can go to the model compiler where we can do some um, more detailed or specific work to the model so that they can meet the requirements of different uh, hardware. Here we may use the technologies like graph conversion, conversion or layer fusion. After that, we will have our um, inference engine to do or to do the um, model loading and the model running work. Um, for now, we have support all the different uh, deployment environments, such as cloud, edge, and uh, the uh, embedded devices. For the cloud environment, we think that the um, there are typically very um, very very uh, very much. Um, computing resources. It is also often equipped uh, with uh, uh, with uh, big GPU clusters, along with storage clusters and management nodes. In such uh, scenarios, Adelic will uh, wrap the models in a single uh, container and ex expose the uh, service out, uh, to the outside via a, a universal portal. And if you want to deploy the model to the edge, it will, uh, the Adelic will recommend you to wrap several models together in one container so that we can make full use of the resources in this edge, edge, uh, edge environment. And uh, if you want to uh, deploy the model in the embedded device, we will, we will directly provide uh, a binary file of the model so that you can directly uh, use it uh, uh, in, in the in in the uh, embedded environment so you do not have much latency and uh, sorry and uh, also you can save the computing resources here is an um, architecture of Adelic optimizer here uh, for the optimizer, we have three um, tools, just like I said before. Um, first is a pr pruner. Uh, it, for now, we have supported uh, the pruning for filters and for channels. And uh, um, with that, we can get uh, uh, the, uh, the blocks and the parameters reduced a lot. And also we have support uh, uh, the combined distillation which uh, greatly improved the accuracy of the model. Uh, and uh, here uh, you can see the chart here. In this chart, we actually used uh, the distillation um, of, uh, of a big uh, um, ResNet 15 model. Um, we, used it, uh, we used two of them as uh, um, teachers, teacher networks and uh, we distilled the knowledge from them to the, uh, to the student network. We also supported the quantization, 8-bit uh, eight, eight quantization. And uh, this process only takes only a small batch of data set and a few minutes. And you can see from this test bed that uh, um, we, after the optimization uh, of pruning, distillation, and quantization, we can have um, about uh, the 7% uh, uh, size of the original one. Here is how the model compiler works. 
you can see that now we support several original training models and target runtime formats. And uh, you can see that uh, the training frameworks we support is very, uh, uh, there are many of them. Uh, the first is Keras, and we also have TensorFlow, PyTorch, Paddle, and MXNet. And we support them to be converted to TVM, uh, TensorFlow, Safe the Model, OpenVINO, IR, TensorRT, and TFLight. And all this compiling is done uh, via a unified compiling request. And uh, this is an end-to-end -end -end compilation using uh, DAG generation. For now, we uh, have support model quantization for TF Lite, TensorFlow, and OpenVINO. Here is the architecture of inference engine. In the uh, here, you can see that uh, the runtime, the TensorFlow, OpenVINO, TensorRT, TF Lite, ML. Actually, you can add your own runtime based on your requirements via our serving SDK. And then the model manager uh, is used to do work like model upload from the model store. And if there's any uh, new uh, models here, it can do the model, up, uh, model update. And then the scheduler uh, can do the model scheduling uh, to the model that was uh, managed by the model manager. And uh, the scheduling can do some a different scheduling type like the multi runtime, multi model, and multi instance based on your own requirements. After that, the uh, inference service can be exposed via the HTTP or RPC server to the to to the clients. For now, we have integrated uh, a new uh, runtime recently, uh, which is a uh, paddle inference runtime. Here is a use case of Adelic Cloud Native. You can see that um, first we use a container of the model compiler. And uh, in this container, we compile the model uh, very, very simply. Uh, simply. But, and uh, then we get an uh, open Vino model. And then uh, with the Adelic serving, uh, serving inference of open Vino, we can run the model uh, in no time. And you can get the inference service via the gRPC port or the HTTP port. That's quite simple. You can try it by yourself from our GitHub repo. Here is another use case of how Adelic is used in embedded devices. You can see that we have uh, our we have done our uh, done our benchmark test in just a Nano and Raspberry Pi. First, we deploy Adelic inference engine in these devices, and then we uh, run the models that was optimized by Adelic optimizer, uh, like ResNet 50 Inception v3. And then we can uh, get the whole pipeline down very simply. You can see the test results of this test in our GitHub uh, to find more details. Here, um, let me uh, introduce you a few um, practices in Adelaide newest version, uh, newest release, which is our cheetah release. The first one is model graph optimization. Unlike the, um, uh, unlike the uh, optimization in model optimizer, which are generally, uh, which has uh, some general optimizations like pruning and distillation. Here, uh, we focus on some um, simplification that will access, uh, that will accelerate the calculation process by some equivalent transformation. We provide some basic rules by, uh, for a graph optimization some uh, general rules like constant folding and layer fusion, and some are specific to some special models like ResNet 50, V1, and YOLO. Here is an example of how we provide optimization to ResNet 50. Here is a model, right? And uh, you can see that we go through the layers of the ResNet 50 uh, network. And uh, then uh, for each block that match our predefined rule, we will do the corresponding, uh, cor cor corresponding uh, optimization. 
uh, like this, we do the combination of the um, convolution layer and the batch normalization layer, which can greatly reduce the um, calculation of the um, uh, M uh, of, uh, of Mac. And uh, then here we do the layer confusion of the, um, the folded comb and the BN layer and uh, along with the ReLU layer so that uh, um, we save the time for the data read and write. So the inference will be fastened greatly. We also have some um, optimizations such as dried optimization. And uh, after all the optimizations, you can say that we have great improvement in uh, uh, this our pre previous the, uh, benchmark. Uh, here is another practice of Adelic uh, compiler where we did some optimization on the process of operating scheduling for TVM. As we can see, the auto TVM schedules the deep learning operator with a scheduling template. The scheduling optimization is often based on the single operator, which may not ge uh, generate, uh, which may not be globally optimal. And we still need to find some parameters which are not determined by the template by some optimization algorithms on the uh, target hardware. Adelic cheetah version made this whole uh, searching process more quickly by narrowing down the search space based on our practical, practical experience. In the execution process, we have uh, used uh, VTune to collect some profile information like hotspot memory consumption and memory access. And with that, we can get a, a closed loop um, execution like, like this. Here is another um, example of our compiling process. You see, actually, deep learning compiler like TVM optimizes the inference process by changing the IR of the deep learning model so that better machine can be generated to run on the device but it's not always useful. And that's why we have implemented our own code gen framework to do the, uh, to, to do the um, final work. We, uh, we use it to, to, um, to uh, do, do the compiling instead of the original LLVM to compile the model into binary files that we can, that we can run the model on uh, x80, six or ARM device. It will generate high level and uh, uh, low level code. The high level code uh, is written in C++ and uh, it's used for uh, gener generating the model call function. And it also does some work like thread scheduling and management. And uh, the lev low level code is the um, OP implementation with assembly language. And uh, then um, based on the device instruction uh, set, the high level code and the le low level code are compiled together as the final model file. Here is another practice um, based on, uh, based on uh, what we have said just now. It's a practice of how we optimize the um, design of dense op operator. We use the par parallelization and the blocking here to um, separate uh, the uh, metrics of input and uh, the uh, and and the weight with metrics, so that they can the calculation of these blocks can be divided to different threads. To, uh, accelerate, to accelerate the calculation process. Also the, um, the blocking technology here uh, made the um, uh, cache hit rate go faster here. You can see that from the benchmark test, um, there 
there uh, we can see a five percent to seven percent boost via the VS the um, one DNN framework. Here are some um, development status of Adelic. For now, we have released the three versions. The first is called Envelope, and then the Bear and the Cheetah. So uh, for now, we have um, already supported all the mainstream frameworks, uh, uh, and we are still doing something more to make Adelic um, can be more useful. Um, recently, we have support for Paddle Inference TVM8, and now we are working on to link all the components of Adlib together so uh, we can have a one-stop automated pipeline. And uh, then we will explore into for exploration um, and uh, doing some things uh, like this uh, until we graduate from LFAI. And uh, I think the one-stop automated pipeline uh, will be the uh, most important thing because that's what we uh, that that's how we make AI more accessible. And uh, the next step, uh, uh, one of the next steps is our uh, uh, optimized uh, then NAS. Actually, then NAS was provided uh, was proposed by Alibaba. And uh, uh, the basic idea behind this is two parts. The first one is the Z score. It, repre it represents the network expressivity and the poss poss possibly positively correlates with the model accuracy. And based on the Z score, uh, Alibaba uh, gets the proposed the uh, Zen NAS. Uh, which uh, is a NAS algorithm by maximizing the then score of the target network on the given inference budget. Within less than half GPU day, then NAS is able to directly search high performance architectures in a data-free style, which means that if you use this architecture, you do not need to train the network, which means that it will be quite faster. And based on the original uh, ZenNAS, we have done some optimization. First, we support distributed training by Horvath and PyTorch to um, better uh, accelerate the training process. And uh, then uh, we, we optimize the algorithms, some algorithms in the framework to accelerate the whole process. And, uh, uh, we also do some bug fixes um, jobs in search process of low latency model. And here is the test uh, results of uh, before, before and after we optimize uh, the NAS. We can see that in this 50,000 uh, um, iteration, the search time for the uh, low latency model um, it is reduced a lot, and uh, at the same time, the then score is greatly uh, increased. And the, uh, the, the last one is about the auto scheduler. Uh, before, we have talked about the auto TVM, and uh, for it, we will get, uh, uh, get uh, uh, further improvements for this, for the, for, for the framework we will get a, a re reinforcement learning based auto scheduler based on answer. And uh, all of this will accelerate the pace of how the, um, how, how, how the um, config is, uh, is fine. And that's all for my presentation. Now you can uh, get the whole idea behind Adelic of, of what Adelic is and what Adelic do and uh, what it is composed of and what it will do in the future. And we hope all of you can join us in Adelic uh, ecosystem and build it together. And um, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. So today I found a great presentation. Uh, here are two questions uh, from G. So. Uh, we can combine uh, the two in one. 
is ethnic uh, complex is ethnic uh, complex to deploy. Uh, no, actually, like yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah, complain yeah, two answer. in one. I actually want to ask, uh, I don't know if our runtime environment is suitable for deploying Adelic. Uh, in a word, uh, Adelic is not uh, difficult to, uh, to be deployed. We provide a, a, a image, um, a Docker image for you to deploy the container based uh, um, Adelic. And also you can try other forms and you can find the uh, uh, deployment solutions in our GitHub uh, uh, repo. So the last one, uh, what's your next plan for Adric? Um, as me. I just, yeah, thank you, Link, for your question. Uh, that's a good question. And uh, uh, I show some steps in the last few uh, slides of my presentation. Actually, we are going to um, uh, get the, the, the uh, every components in Adelic together so you can use it one stop. That means that you get your business requirements and you get the model and we can deploy the model for you. And uh, you, can, you don't need to do, uh, you, there is no effort from you is needed. Uh, and also we are doing some um, frontier uh, research like in for uh, inference and uh, um, yeah you can you can see see the text uh, uh, of me and uh, I will provide it uh, to the IT staff and uh, it's all in the last few uh, few slides thank you okay second you can yeah thank you uh, the next uh, we will Introduce Yu Yue. Yu Yue is an associate professor in the College of Computer and National University of Defense Technology and the director of Operation Center of Open IOS Community. He received his PhD degree in computer science from NUDT. 20, oh, 2016, he has all understanding PhD thesis award from Hunan Press. His research findings have been published on many magazines. His current research interests include software engineer, data mining, and uh, computer supported uh, cooperative work. Okay, let's welcome Yue Yu. Thank you, Yu. Thanks for introduction. And let me share my screen. Let's see. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, uh, thanks for invitation. And it's my honor to give a brief introduction about uh, what we do uh, in China to build a AI eco ecosystem and the service environment to uh, serve more uh, developers and contributors in China. So we build a community called OpenAI. Uh, it's like open intelligence and means uh, hope everybody can contribute to our, to this ecosystem and build a more great future for AI. So uh, today I will give three part uh, uh, presentation about what we are thinking about open source and uh, AI and what we do uh, in China and how our community are like. So uh, as, as we can say, uh, the, the first generation about open source is uh, like a genius driven uh, model. So like the uh, Rachel, Dennis Rachel and he do the, and Unix uh, 
OS uh, operation system just because he want to play his game more convenience. And the the other one, like uh, Stallman, built uh, the GPL license, which is a funding, uh, which is a a great law about uh, o- o- open source uh, community because he don't like the concept of software being private uh, property, not sharing to everybody. So, but uh, uh, entering the, um, especially to uh, after 20, uh, uh, 2000 and 2000 year, and uh, there is a lot of uh, great open source uh, immersed and there is a software war, so-called software war in that time. Uh, there is many uh, great software uh, uh, counter with the empire of Microsoft, like uh, Linux open source uh, OS, like the browser, like uh, Mozilla, Firefox, and database, like uh, Oracle. Uh, uh, the all products uh, want to replace some official uh, or commercial software and use an open source way. But uh, after that, uh, many, uh, uh, the open source people think is a more uh, suitable uh, paradigm to organize people or to uh, uh, gather the power to build a good software. So many business and commercial um, company joined the open source uh, ecosystem and they found some project and they uh, opened their technology to build the ecosystem and to uh, develop, develop their, uh, their new uh, uh, models or new uh, tools to, for developers and make the whole business more fluent. So uh, after the, but what do we, what can we see next? Especially for this time, everybody work on the internet. We think the open source uh, is more suitable format to organize a large scale group uh, people to do some great innovation work. Everybody can uh, join the, the open source system, ecosystem. Uh, here is an example, it's very interesting, maybe in China, the, uh, a great uh, famous singer Wang Yihong learns uh, coding online uh, a few months ago. And we can see the huge change in her face. Uh, when he joined the, the coding, uh, become a, a programmer, uh, he has a, a very huge change in, her fa- in his face. And it will be say the coding is very brainstorm uh, and the open source community maybe push him to update the code every day. So uh, what's different uh, become the, uh, uh, between the open source and the traditional software uh, production, uh, like uh, 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 we build the software in Microsoft or IBM before uh, uh, they have some uh, enterprise developer plan for and have user uh, driven or requirement driven. Uh, they have some uh, important requirements uh, means they uh, product their software to meet the requirements and, and the essence of the, the, the logic behind the Traditional software engineering is quality-centric production, but in open source, it's much like some uh, opus driven. It's, in, uh, it's inspiration between the developers and the, uh, the everybody, maybe uh, the geeks, the students, and they have their uh, uh, innovation and have their, if they have some good idea, they can do a, a great try and the incense behind the open source is share in trade crowd uh, or creation. It's like a, a typical example about uh, crowd wisdom, uh, which the great, so- great software is 
some crowd with then emerge. So uh, if you're familiar with the, the Ganner uh, hyper, hyper curve, uh, the, the, which uh, describe the, the technology maturity uh, in, the, in some area, uh, the AI uh, now is the, uh, like some in the early stage. And then uh, I, uh, this curve, this bit, uh, the technology uh, from the early stage to uh, developing stage and then to the uh, stable stage means well-developed. So the AI now is in the early stage. So uh, it actually in the early stage is more suitable for open source. It's the golden age about for the open source. If you compare other like cloud computing, like operating system, EDA technology, there are some uh, very uh, stable in today. But AI is an emerging, especially for this time, is a, a seed of innovation stage. They have some uh, many, many chance, chance to do some great job. And if you deeply uh, into the hyper cycle for AI, just for AI, they have some uh, very, uh, great discussion to see why uh, the future of AI is open source. And they have some uh, great, uh, uh, great uh, project or some, uh, so some primary uh, technology like use the open source uh, style to organize their project in GitHub. Uh, I just used the uh, uh, journal uh, AI, which is now in the trying stage. So uh, we can find some uh, interesting project in GitHub. Also, uh, some well-developed technology for AI like deep learning computation. Now, the there is there are rich open source uh, uh, resources in the internet like. Many papers are open source. Behind that, there are uh, algorithm, there are benchmark, there are data, there are code, there are model, are all open source in the internet. So uh, if you look at the uh, uh, open source paradise, in, it's very important for AI. But uh, And what we do in this time, first, we want to build a powerful and a solid infrastructure uh, for uh, AI. Like uh, uh, we build a, a cloud brain, uh, we call it cloud brain, which is a, a HPC uh, cluster for AI computing is a, and surrounding the, the cloud base, this plan for we want to connect other computing uh, center and do a network for AI. And running on this uh, cluster, we can build some uh, very interesting models and applications uh, over the infrastructure. And we have uh, our own uh, software architecture about this uh, platform. Also, we want to build a community, uh, which is like some foundation, like Linux Foundation. It's very famous foundation all over the world. And we learned from the Linux Foundation and we want to build a AI foundation in China. And we have our community program organization membership and the project our and our developers to build this, to organize in, in our uh, community. And before that, and we, in the beginning, and we only have few projects like uh, uh, op uh, casting, cluster operating environment for AI cluster, like we, we call it open eye octopus and some data cooperation environment, uh, and some algorithm framework for deep learning, for reinforcement learning. 
And then we, we extract more projects into our ecosystem uh, and we have some uh, extent our ability uh, about AI, the software stack. And now we have a very, uh, you can see in different stage, in different uh, la layer, we have many projects to uh, build a whole, uh, to, to support the whole AI uh, ecosystem and the uh, algorithm to run. We have model library, like uh, a big model, like GPT model in China, Chinese GPT, we call the Pangu model and Wudang model for uh, NLP area. And we have uh, robot skilled uh, model zoom for the uh, AI robot. And also we have some many tools to do some like uh, model exchange, model uh, compress, and we have some uh, deep learning framework and we have some, uh, uh, is, uh, we have some uh, framework for the industry uh, production like uh, uh, TCL, uh, in the TCL uh, com company. Here, we, I give some example about this uh, project. First, we have built a, a very large uh, model for NLP, we call the Pangu, which is 200 billion parameters. Uh, the whole thing is open source. And to build this, we have uh, combined the uh, power from Huawei from Pengchen Lab, from uh, Peking University, and from Manusport uh, community and other community. And this model attracts many attention from all over the world, uh, especially for the uh, uh, the GPT three uh, team, and they have some discussion with us and how to uh, what to discuss the difference and the technology about the huge model, how to build a good, huge model. And uh, it's by for the model and we open source all the tools uh, surrounding the, by this model, like uh, the GPU version, because this model is built from the uh, Huawei NPU uh, processor. Uh, we have some GPU uh, tours, supported tour to, to change the model, which can run in over the GPU platform. And we build a language model for a multi-language ex exchanger translator and based on the big model. Also all the Chinese data set and how to process the data, all the tours we, ha we have open sourced. And the other uh, example is the, uh, we have tried to uh, explore the third generation about deep learning. Uh, we, and we build a simulation framework for, uh, to, to uh, easier to, uh, for developers to design their SNN algorithm, uh, which is, which is uh, used in the academic also uh, some industry company uh, can use the, our framework. And this is uh, the software architecture about the uh, Spelly Jelly, we call Spelly Jelly, uh, which is a toolbox and have some API and some data and some uh, basic models to support as an algorithm developer. Also, we have some tour boards for the com for neuroscience uh, to do some research, uh, which meets some uh, requirement like easy to learn and use, flexible and transparent uh, simulation with analyze and uh, efficient efficient run speeds. Uh, the whole projects can be found in our, our website and can can and also. Uh, based on these tools, there are many people do some models, and you can also find these models in the model zoom. 
So uh, last, I want to give some uh, introduction about our uh, how our community works and some activities of our community. First, we are not a foundation because in China it's hard to build hard to, uh, to have a, to to build a foundation uh, legally and we, but we are some non-profit non-profit organization and the community for the technology and the developer and the projects. So we want to do some uh, international uh, uh, innovation cooperation. Uh, actually, we, we are the associate member uh, of Linux Foundation, especially for the AI and Data Foundation. And we also have a good operation of the Open Autumn Foundation, which is the only one legally foundation for software in China. And we want to, we have our own project, uh, uh, cultivation channel, which means we have, we can uh, uh, build, uh, establish a project, incubate a project and gradually to decide which one can graduate. And we have our uh, operate, operation centers in different area because China is very huge and we want to uh, give our open source theory to everywhere and make a, a widely cooperation with some company, some university, some organizations to build a good long-term and stable uh, operation system. Here is some uh, what we do in China. We like the, we, we think the, the uh, community like a big tree and the soil uh, based on the culture of the colleague and the universities uh, to uh, unearthing some talent and uh, training the students to learn what is the open source, how to join the open source and how to contribute to an open source project. And the trunk of this tree is uh, we have our uh, um, famous, uh, we want to build a uh, famous and uh, have great influence activities like international AI competition, AI Expose uh, developer conference to uh, to build a whole chunk of the district. And the other branches is some like lecture, like developer communication, hackathon, technology salon uh, to uh, make the, the whole uh, ecosystem more diverse and uh, active. Here is the student group in the uh, university we built. Uh, now we have five student group in China and we have some uh, lectures and in this student uh, group and we bring our uh, projects to the uh, to, uh, to, to the company and give some technology uh, training about this uh, to these students. And we have our uh, uh, great conference about the developers and we uh, elect some uh, famous uh, projects or high, high quality projects and some uh, great contributors uh, in our conference. And we have built a, a good uh, international uh, competition about uh, AI technology to build a model, to build uh, algorithm innovation and to, to make more uh, technology can, can have some uh, good idea in the application stage. And we design our compute computation system like a step by step. Maybe a very easy in the early stage, we call the bronze zone race and civil race and golden race and then final race to build a high to get a highly the most uh, a big achieve. 
and we have our uh, very uh, famous uh, conference and expose in China and invite many fellow uh, uh, very uh, have uh, very uh, good company to give the talk and to uh, give their technology exposed for the every de developers. Here is our activities from uh, 2018 and now we are very young community but we do our best to uh, build a whole ecosystem and a service environment for the AI developers. Here is the all of my talk, thanks. Okay, thanks to you as share of uh, OpenAI community. Here are question from Linway at the Flavor Tech. Uh, how could a uh, open source project to be contributed to OpenAI? Is it free? How about the IPR for the contributed project? Yeah, I think it's a good question here. Uh, we are non-profit organization, so we don't charge any free. Uh, if your project is uh, good, uh, we are welcome to contribute to our OpenAI. We have our if you can see the screen, you can uh, uh, access our website to submit your project. And we have our own uh, project host uh, system like uh, Chinese GitHub maybe. So you can uh, upload your project there and we can, uh, our secretary will uh, contact you. And we don't own your IPR and you can run your IPR yourself. We just want to uh, make your project more famous. Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Yu. Uh, let's move to uh, the next topic. Uh, we will introduce T. Joe. Tito currently serves as the tech leader of Panda Panda open source ecosystem at the, and the senior architecture in Beidou. He's also the technique and military council member of LFAR and Date Foundation. Currently, T is focused on interesting, uh, for folks are integrating Panda Panda deep learning framework with cloud native stack with in, with in depth experience over deep learning framework development and architecture design. T helps the developer to deploy cloud native deep learning on private and public cloud. Okay, let's move transfer the microphone to T. Joe. Thank you, T. Joe. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, let's go ahead. Hi, everyone. This is TJ from Baidu. I'm the tech lead of Pedal Pedal Open Source Ecosystem. And today, I'm glad to be invited by ITU and make a talk about Pedal Pedal Open Source Deep Learning Framework. The talk's title is Better Deep Learning Framework, Better the World. Today's talk will mainly talk about Pedal Pedal Deep Learning Framework design. We will have a brief introduction of Pedal Pedal Framework, and then we will talk about Pedal Pedal Framework design details. And then we will introduce Pedal Pedal development tool chains and Pedal Pedal industrial level model zoo. At last, we will talk about Pedal Pedal suites and tools and the Pedal Pedal developer ecosystem. For people who are not familiar with Pedal Pedal, let me give out a brief introduction of Pedal Pedal Deep Learning Framework. In 2012, DNN models were introduced in Baidu. Deep learning technologies <coughs> were adopted in audio recognition, OCI application, etc. In 2013, Institute of Deep Learning, IDL, got established. 
and deep learning platform Palopedo start design. In 2014, Palopedo started to support large scale district training and deep learning models being applied in search engine business for the first time. And in 2015, Baidu published the very first online neural machine translation system. In 2016, Baidu open sourced Palopedo to public. In 2017, Palopedo empowered the numerous internal AI business in Baidu from autonomous driving to search engine optimization. And Baidu co-founded the National Engineering Lab for Deep Learning Technology and Application. In 2018, Palo Palo Core Framework v1.0 got released. In 2019, the most powerful NLP model, Ernie, got established and released. In 2020, Palo Palo Core Framework v2.0 got released. Currently, Palo Palo is China's first fully open source deep learning platform, and it is also an agile framework for industrial development of deep neural networks. Palo Palo deep learning framework supports both declarative programming and imperative programming. Palo Palo also supports ultra large scale training of deep neural networks. Inside Baidu, Palo Palo supports the training of deep neural network with 100 billion of features and trillions of parameters by using data distributed over hundreds of nodes. Palo Palo includes and maintains more than 100 mainstream models that have been polished for a long time in the industry. Some of these models have won major prize from well-known international competitions. In the meanwhile, Palo Palo has more than 200 pre-trained models to facilitate the rapid development of industrial applications. We can see the graph that Palo Palo projects are organized by four parts, the core framework, the basic model bank, the end-to-end -end de development toolkit, and the, the developer toolkit. In terms of framework basic capabilities, Palo Palo has designed a unique deep learning calculation description method and framework system. With complete expression capabilities and efficient execution characteristics, which is more intuitive for developers. Based on these features, Palapedo is naturally supporting two programming paradigms, dynamic graph for development and debugging, and a static graph for training and deployment. Palapedo also natively supports the conversion of dynamic and static graphs with one-line code. Palapedo's IR design with simplicity and high performance preserved, seamlessly bridging the distributed training and the inference together. And Palo Palo also implements sophisticated optimization strategies for efficient scheduling and execution on heterogeneous hardware devices. In terms of dynamic and static conversion interface, it has reached the industrial leading level in the broad coverage of Python syntax. And it is also very simple in operation. You only need to add a small decorator to seamlessly and smoothly transfer from dynamic graph to static graph. And in order to facilitate developers to check whether the converted static graph code meets expectation, Palo Palo also designed a compiler-like feature to help users, including error message corresponding to the dynamic graph code line, set a breakpoint, and view the converted static graph code as well as the immediate uh, stage transition view, allowing users to easily view the transition information. The dynamic and static conversion needs to go through several steps, such as the dynamic graph source code to the abstract syntax tree. The abstract syntax tree can be used to rewrite and convert to the static graph code. With Palo Palo 2.0, users can view the syntax conversion log for each step. It is convenient for developers to de debug. Palpado also supports running as dynamic graph operator, which is flexible to use on the dynamic graph mode. There's no need to use static graph interface any longer. In general, the dynamic and static conversion function of Palpado is in the leading position in the industry. Distributed training is another core feature of Palpado. The English name of Palo is the abbreviation of Parallel Distributed Deep Learning. We, are, we have always designed and, and implemented deep distributed capabilities as a very important part of the core framework. 
polished by a wide range of actual business scenarios, the distributed training capabilities have been continuously optimized. While at the same time, it has also achieved the, the coverage of the most extensive parallel modes and acceleration strategies. Because pedal pedal distributed training and the core framework are integrated, this is very easy for distributed training to gain the performance advantages from the core framework. We can see that training extension from pedal pedal standalone training to multi device training is very simple. It only needs to be configured through a unified minimalist um, API and strategy, and the rest can be done automatically by the framework. Let's see how pedal pedal distributed training architecture got evolved in these years. In 2018, the first generation of pedal pedal distributed training constituted of pure CPU machines and the parameter server model could support model training with trillions of sparse parameters. Later, as the network structure in the model become more complex, as well as the pursuit of training efficiency, the panel parameter server technology also get, got updated. And the second generation pure GPU parameter server was introduced, which integrated with three layer storage architecture and RPC and NCCL hybrid communication with multiple state-of-the-art uh, technologies, the model training support by the previous like 100 GPU or CPU machine can be substituted with only one multi-card GPU machine. Recently, Paddle, Paddle Framework 2.0 was launched. The third generation um, parameter server technology, which is the industry's first universal heterogeneous parameter server, Relieve the shackles of strictly using the same hardware machines for training in the traditional primary server mode. Training tasks can uh, right now are no longer sensitive to the hardware, and the different hardware can be used for mixed heterogeneous training at the same time. And you can see after the test, in the network uh, environment of two GPU node and two CPU node, the training speed is comparable to the training speed that can be achieved by the traditional parameter service mode on the four GPU node network. The hardware cost is greatly reduced, makes the best use of everything and optimize training efficiency. Recently, in order to be able to train large scale model efficiently, Panel Paddle has evolved, uh, innovated, launched the industry's first 4D hybrid parallel strategy based on collective communication technology. That is the data parallel and the model parallel, the pipeline parallel, and the group parameter slicing, which we call the sharding. Uh, four strategies are used in combination to increase the training efficiency. Through the 4D hybrid parameter strategy, users can completely training task for dense parameter models with a scale of hundreds of billions. After testing, using the 4D hybrid parallel strategy to train 230 billion parameter earning model, the training speed reaches more than 8,000 tokens per second, which is at least 23% faster than the 3D hybrid parallel strategy. At present, most of Baidu's intelligent services are powered by the pad pedal framework provided the training and inference support, such as Baidu APP, Tieba, Baidu Map, Baidu Translation, etc. In terms of the inference, Pado Pado's inference architecture is fully compatible with a wide range of hardware, which is located in the cloud, mobile, and edge side, and it supports various operation system uh, platforms, such as Linux, Windows, macOS, Android, and iOS. Among them, Palo Palo's native inference library maintains a strong connection with the training framework and can reuse part of the training optimization strategy to achieve the most comprehensive model support. For mobile and edge scenarios, Palo Palo provides an independent lightweight inference engine, Palo Light, uh, to provide high performance support for end-to-end -end solutions. Pedal also support pluggable logging, 
of external inference acceleration library. For example, TensorRT can be integrated to achieve flexible acceleration of some calculations. So in order to support industrial application, Palo provides full process deep learning development tools. For the developed and the trained model, developers can choose to use Palo Slim to do compression processes such as pruning, quantification, or distillation of the model. For different hardware and software development environments, Palo Palo provides the complete inference deployment tools mentioned earlier and implements a, co a complete tool chain. At the same time, Palo Palo also supports deployment after model format conversion by using X2 Palo and Palo to Onyx. Currently, Palo Palo supports more than 270 official models covering NLP, CV, speech, and recommendations. We have four base model zoo, including Palo CV, Palo NLP, Paddle speech and a rack. And for each model zoo, we have several test level specific fields. Like for Paddle CV, we have uh, image classification, object detection, segmentation, etc. For each test, we developed all related algorithm operators. For most of the operators are used in the industries, and some of them are the winner of the worldwide competitions. In terms of application, the combination of artificial intelligence and the real world is becoming more and more extensive. In the past, AI applications landing were participated by enterprises with distinctive uh, computer professionals, such as internet. However, we find from the data on BioBrain AI capability open platform that in recent years, non-IT professional enterprises have participated in AI application landing more and more. This shows that the training of AI technology in the industry is no longer limited to the single category of internet. It has spread to more and more industries. So in addition to the core framework, Palo Palo has also open sourced a large number of suite and tools. Through these kits and tools, helps developers to various industries to improve the efficiency of AI deployment. For example, Palo Detection is a target detection kit based on the Palo Palo framework. It adopts a modular design and implements development and deployment end-to-end -to, -end to help users train better models and apply them in the real world. It has rich functionality, including data augmentation, modeling, training, compression, and deployment to lower the barrier of for industrial applications. At present, it has supported more than 20 target detection algorithms, including PPULO, TTFNet, HTC, more than 30 backbone networks, and more than 170 pre-trained models, of which PPULO v2 is the key feature model. PPULO v2 has excellent performance at the same speed compared with ULO v4 and ULO v5. For scenarios where model size and prediction speed are required, Palo Palo finally implemented the PPULO tiny model through a series of optimization methods with a size of only 1.3 megabyte, and the prediction delay was also reduced to 10 milliseconds. Palo OCR is Palo Palo's text recognition switch. It provides comprehensive support for algorithm support in data production, open source modeling to predictive deployment, and implements every aspect of the learning process. It has the following characteristics in general. The first one is it supports 80 plus multi-language recognition models such as Chinese, Latin, Arabic, Japanese, Korean, etc. And the effect exceeds the computing process like easy OCR. The second one is the ultra lightweight Chinese and English OCR model with the smallest and the most effective 3.5 megabyte model in the industry. The third one is 
maintains three kinds of text detection algorithms and five kinds of text recognition algorithms. The first is the style text, a data synthesis tool that supports text style migration, metal nameplate, and Korean scene verification. The accuracy rate is increased by more than 15%. The fifth is the PPOCR label, an open source semi automatic text data labeling tool improves labeling efficiency by 60% to 80%. The sixth one is uh, provides a wealthy of predictive deployment tools, including quick inference based on the PIP installation of the wheel package, and the reasoning based on Python or C++ prediction server, and the supports service-based deployment and end-to-end -end deployment. Title NLP is an easy to use text field de development library. Developed based on Palo Palo Framework v2.0, designed to allow developers to complete the deployment of NLP applications more efficiently. It is it's built in core API and rich present NLP application examples can greatly improve the efficiency of developers' second development. The Transformer API in the core API can include all the early family series training models developed by Baidu, as well as many leading pre-trained models so that everyone can quickly complete model selection and modeling. The dataset API integrates a thousand word dataset, which contains many datasets with Chinese characteristics, such as do learner, do reader, do com, etc. Bringing researchers a one-stop dataset research experience. In addition to deep learning, Palo Palo also pays great attention to the integration with other technologies to provide support for the future development of AI technology, such as graph learning, deep reinforced learning, federated learning, quantum machine learning, and biological computing. Palo Palo has done a lot of work and has achieved very good technology research and development and application landing. At present, Palo Palo has been widely used in the real industry in China, covering over 130,000 enterprises, 400,000 modeling over 20 industries, which includes the QC, agriculture, steering, security, logistics, electric power, medical treatment, rescue, meteorology, education, and etc. In terms of developer ecosystem, Palo Palo has invested heavily in building ecosystem environment through PPDE, PPSIG, PP Club, and other forms. According to GitHub 2020 Digital Insight report, in 2020, GitHub China Project Activity Top 20, Palo Palo occupies two items, of which the open source framework ranked three. Currently, it has obtained 91,000 star in GitHub open source community and has topped the list of GitHub training and paper with code for many times. For more information about Palo Palo Deep Learning Framework, you can scan the QR code here. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Tito's interest in showcase of kind of part of helicopter here. Yes, Eric, hey, standing by. Uh, Hello? Yes. Um, Can I share my screen? Oh, sure, definitely. Okay. Go ahead. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So it's my pleasure to join the event and uh, to report uh, 
appropriate sets and understandings about AI. So uh, I think I'm going to talk it has will be very different from uh, other speakers because it's going to be much less of technical details, but more about the application levels. So what we are looking at is mostly about the, the meaningful AI solutions by the uh, massive communities. So this is Eric Pan from uh, the studio. I think now do we have some quite some Chinese uh, audiences here? Um, we found the, the makerspace in Shenzhen called Chaihuo, and we do make fair every year to gather the innovators around to use open tech for uh, diverse innovations. So we have uh, believed in open tech and bottom-up innovation from uh, many years ago, and we now been very actively supporting the UN SDG goals. So briefly speaking about SEED, we provide open source hardware from 2008. It has been 13 years we keep like di uh, integrating new technology into open source hardware and supply to global community. We have uh, over 1 million uh, developers all over the world. And now we are um, moving on to create more IoT and AI devices for people to integrate into their solution and uh, also to customize. And then in 2011, we created the makerspace called Chaihuo. We can see it as a prototyping center in Shenzhen. It's becoming a base cap for a lot of uh, startups or innovators. They want to create new tech, especially hardware tech in Shenzhen. We provide the, base, the basic materials and equipments. And also, more importantly, it's a network of innovators. So for the business model of Seed, we um, are in the middle of the uh, venue chain of uh, IoT. First, we collect silicons and the algorithm from the uh, top tier suppliers. We integrate them into open source hardware. It's similar to uh, uh, open source software, but uh, you can easily integrate them to form up a new device to um, embed AI and IoT inside. And by doing that, we have worked with the maker community across the planet. And uh, a lot of uh, non-traditional engineers has been able to create their own devices. So we work with them closely to put them into configurable IoT and AI solution. And we see more and more system integrators uh, using IoT and AI for emerging needs and uh, scanner needs. And among them, we see a big uh, scanner are falling into SDG goals. So this is more detailed, uh, um, how to say, process. They take the tech developers seeing seed as a, their arsenal. They pick from uh, uh, our open source modules from uh, several thousand of them. They find their like edge computing uh, main boards. They find the sensors and through so the uh, scenario dev kits to put them into their MVP. And uh, because all, all the uh, hardware that open source is very easy for them to redesign and include them into their uh, um, like engineering samples, and we provide the service to help them to bring the first uh, small batch manufacturers and uh, enlarge them into large quantity. And you see a lot of uh, uh, needs. They are not only in the laboratory to do some research, but also goes into outdoors, goes into the real productivity uh, sites. So we work closely with the, the scenarios to create. Um, ready to use non-lasting stuff from the like weather stations to outdoor sensors for agriculture. And we work closely with the community to create the, the case study and to share among the uh, ecosystem. So to our observations, we see a very good opportunity for to use AI for the for goods, for SDG, sustainability, et cetera. And uh, one important, the, First, first criteria is the people. We see more and more people are involved in technology innovations. They, are, they might not be trained as engineer, but they have the passion. They coming from different industries, but today they can use uh, embedded system, AI, IoT to really uh, create new inventions. And we see this as um, the maker movement in China, we call it the Dazhong Chuangye, Wandong Chuangxing. It has been created a lot of possibilities and educating our students 
to realize that they are not the consumers only. They can be the technology creators. And thanks to the open source hardware and software, now they can create something like just in a few months and uh, publish them in the crowdfunding platform and uh, turn them into a business. This has been very pervasive. And uh, people ha are creating more and more complex and sof sophisticated projects from uh, like uh, audio interaction mirrors to like water pollution detections, even auto uh, robotics. And we, we see people are creating not only just uh, out of their hobby, they, because a lot of programs, they are scattered into different locations and different verticals. The people becoming the initiator of new technology and solution. They, are, they might be the benefactor or suff um, suffering from the problems. Now, with new technology, they can find a remedy to the old problem. And we are going to gather people around this year in Shenzhen, in Xinyi, in again, it's called the Make a Fair Shenzhen, Da Wan Chu Chang Feng Hui. We are going to have the people who are trying to innovate to meet the engineers, the tech companies, and uh, to create more showcases and brainstorm around the, the scene. It's going to be November 20 to 21st. And also we see the technology are becoming easier and easier because the tech companies also realized that they suddenly have a much bigger base of innovators. So the technology itself is evolving to become more reliable and uh, 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 easy to use. Among them, I think uh, we catch the eye today is about AI. The best way to coding is no coding. Imagine that in a few years later, you are talking to a robot. You don't pull out a laptop and change the code. You just talk to it. You just train it. So it's a much shorter and easier path for everyday citizens to now use AI to reshape the intelligence of their devices or into their systems around them. So instead of uh, encoding data and rules to get answers, now they can with tag the data to train the rules, to teach the machine to learn what they really need. And we are making this tool sets much, I think it's uh, more like ramping up other speakers doings to make it accessible even for younger students to try to uh, understand the boundary of technology and use them. So for example, we create one little terminal. It's like palm size. It has a microcontroller inside, but now you can just set it up to uh, acquire data from the real environment. And you can use a cloud, uh, no, code, no coding environment to train the data. And then you download the, the binaries. You can just use the device itself to inference, to inference more uh, scenarios. For example, if you feel with uh, multi-channel gas sensors combined with uh, the machine learning on the edge, people now make artificial notes to distinguish different alcohols. So this is not a very strict science. It's done by a lot of hobbyist makers, developers of uh, different backgrounds. And now I think the AI applications has been much, much easier than ever before. And uh, the artificial nose is just the beginning with the modular sensors with the different uh, multi-model trainings, you can do um, endless applications. And we are trying very hard to push this technology to more people so they can understand the they are not waiting for someone to change their lives. They have the new technology to do that by themselves. The only threshold is how do they understand the possibility and uh, to spend some time to get hands on the hardware and combining the uh, AI algorithm together. So as long as we have a massive base of developers who wants to bring change, changes and impacts. And we, also we have the easy, open technology than ever before. We look at what is the why of this maker movement? What is the drive for more open tech to really create a new venue? That's where for a few years ago, we look at SDG. We realized that they, out of the 17 goals, there are so many of them are not 
are not accomplished well by commercial companies today because they might be too standard. Maybe there's too much like uh, overhead just to understand the, the questions, the problems. But uh, with a lot of people participating and uh, to use more open tech, we see the AI solutions are bringing new remedy to a lot of SDG problems. For example, the, the artificial nose project is not a done by an AI expert. It's a principal engineer uh, from Microsoft. In his spare time, he's interested in new technology and done this uh, phenomenon uh, project. And uh, he is very open and sharing to encourage more people to duplicate this project. And we see people using it for like a, a harmful hazardous gas detection use it for like uh, food condition detections. So the equation is endless. As long as you have the common tool sets, you can redo it, retrain the model according to the uh, venue project you're looking at. A second project we have we see is with sensors. There's a, a company called Farms AI. They want to control the, the I want to optimize the yield and the, the uh, to reduce the disease of chicken farms. What they do is they want to, there um, is a ventilator in the chicken farm. Whenever the air is becoming too bad, they start to ventilate it. But if they, there are too much fresh air into the chicken farm, it might bring too much, uh, to lower the temperature, then chicken get diseased. So previously it was done by human beings. They have to monitor, they have to check it, but they have to control it every like a day or hours. It's not uh, fine tuned enough. So what they have been implementing is to have a sensor to understand the digital temperatures, the NH3 uh, emissions from the chickens and to, um, by training the model, they optimize the, uh, the ventilation control on, on the fly. So by doing that, they increase uh, the, the yield of the chicken farm and also to reduce, say, energy consumptions. And the third project is a very grandy one and a very important one is called by uh, FarmBeats. It's initiated by Microsoft. We're supporting them with more uh, agriculture sensors that can be deployed in the field. Because you see there is much bigger, uh, a lot of the bigger fields like for crops, um, requires a lot of fertilizers and irrigations every year. But uh, the, the land itself is not um, ideal. Some of the crops might be uh, too well irrigated, but others are not. But how do you fine tune them? The way the event is to use drones, first uh, to detect from the higher attitude to understand of the drones, because plant itself is a sensor from the color, from the irrigations, you can see which part of the plants requires more fertilizers. So after collecting the data, they calibrate with uh, uh, several sensors, but not like uh, a grid. With the sensor, they calibrate the image data, and then we have a map of irrigation. Then through uh, tractors or drones, they can uh, optimize the fertilizer application in the, as a sequence is they reduce the fertilizer usage, they increase uh, the efficiency of uh, uh, crop um, growth. So by doing that, they can reduce a lot of pollutions. And this is just a year of start. We're doing a field, uh, uh, field test. And uh, this is well driven by the fertilizer chemical companies like Bayer, Unilever, um, and et cetera. So this is just the three of the, the examples. We see a lot of uh, extra, like uh, people use autonomous systems to sell, to clean the, uh, the ocean oil. They use uh, aquaponics to grow more food indoors, especially for like different uh, climate environment. And in India, uh, in Japan, they use the wide area disaster controls with uh, more sensor and, and AI. And also we see people using waste uh, management. We use AI to sort and uh, um, differentiate in different waste uh, management. Not to mention we can have more AGI 
with uh, um, more computation powers inside. But these are not done by regular like AI experts. It's from the open uh, platform people now. They can repurpose them because they might be auction experts. They might be like NGOs. Now they can use the technology in a new um, element. So this is a comment from the gathering of uh, open science hardware from GOSH. Because through the uh, open source like technologies, the NGO, the international organizations, they can increase their innovation capability. And also they, through the openness, we can enable new like multi-stakeholder partnership and collaboration. It's not done by tech technical people like us. It's also involving academia civil society and other pro private sectors to be involved. And we can make science more transparent, may inviting more people to participate global-wise and uh, to make the innovations more decentralized. I think this is a very big hope as we are talking about AI for good today. And as time goes by, we need more social innovators to meet the makers. The makers has the know-how, as we discussed today, we have them we have the methodology, we have the rules, we have the industrial designs. We know the software, we have the algorithms. It's like, like armed to the teeth. We have new devices coming every day, new modules, new silicons from uh, the latest uh, innovation innovators. And we know the materials, but uh, these are all the how, all the means to resolve the problems. Where we need to meet the social innovators. They have, they have the change make we have the um, mindset of change maker and facilitators. They know how to manage the projects, not only in technical way, but in the cross culture in uh, issue resolving ways. They have the skill sets in understanding the problem and to do the critical thinkings. By doing that, we can have ask the maker, invite makers and the social innovators to come up with the proposals and uh, along the demand and the engineering process, it can upgrade into a prototype. It can be, uh, become engineering sample for small bench and uh, deployment. This has to happen today. And we, I think the conversation is already beginning, but we need to encourage more people through the openness. They understand the mission, the meanings of uh, SDG and they start to deploy more, pro no matter it's a small gadget or it's a big dream ideas. So this is a very brief introduction because I want to, the you know, time is short. So if you have other uh, future SDG and tech projects we can collaborate, please uh, write us an email, it's eps.cc. And also we are active in LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter through City Studio uh, handle. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope my talk is not too shabby. Do you have any questions I can answer or explain further? Let me see, there is uh, asking questions. I see many people- uh, Dr. Uh, Ming Wei at uh, FlavorTech. Ask the many people join the Cheho events. Any developers, mm -hmm. any developers involved and have any project uh, be hosted uh -huh. in Cheho? Yes, we, um, we have, a. Actually, Chaihu was initiated by developers. It's from the Shenzhen NAC, Shenzhen Linux user group. It's from the software people who wants to create hardware. And uh, we created this space to invite more innovators to talk with each other and to find shared purposes and work together. And uh, uh, in the beginning it was about Arduino, about embedded systems, but now it has been a lot of HAI, a lot of about uh, like low power IoT. And also we uh, have a lot of uh, uh, events talking about SDG, talking about, uh, it's, it's quite a standard, it's quite decentralized organizations. So if you have any talk, you uh, want to invite more innovators, um, we are at your service. And this, I, I like to repeat again in November this year, November 20th, we are going to put together the biggest developers event. And uh, uh, we are going to talk a lot about SDG. We are going to talk about uh, open innovations. And uh, yeah, you are all invited. If you can come uh, physically, that'd be totally great. And uh, we also have virtual events. 
the perfect model of Chai Huo, um, seed is actually seed is sponsoring Chai Huo by providing the, the basic funds. And uh, like Wang He, the rest company is provided the, the space for free. And we accept the donations as well. There are sponsorships every year. So it's, it's very much like an um, open source organization. Okay, thanks, Erica, uh, sharing and uh, introduced uh, the studio and the showcase. Uh, next, we move to the next speaker, uh, Zhuo Wu. Dr. Zhuo got her PhD from the University of York, UK, in 2006. She worked as an associate professor in Shanghai University from 2006 to 2014, responsible for research in the next generation wireless communication and uh, supervised graduate students. She worked as a research scientist in Belarus, China from 2014 to 2018, responsible for 5G system standardization and AI-related research for industry application. After that, she joined Accenture China as a data scientist, responsible for AI-based solutions design and delivery. She currently works as an AI evangelist in Intel. Okay, that's welcome to Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? All right, I'll get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the AI for Good Summit. Uh, I'm Wu Zhuo. I'm an AI evangelist at Intel. Today, I would like to share with you our experience on open source project, how an open source project could stay alive for 20 years and evolve into OpenVINO at Intel. So first, uh, I would like to invite you to go back to the year of 2000 with me. I would like to invite you to recall at that time, at the year of 2000, which I personally believe it was an important year in computing, which we see the bloom of social media, internet, mobile phones. And of course we have this fear of Y2K millennium bug, which is actually a bug when people first designed computers. They didn't see it run through the year of 2000. So they have this um, date overflow problem. And because most of the systems were closed source at that time, I think people have to pay a lot of money to consultants or technical people to solve this problem. Well, in the same year of 2000, Intel Lab released the first version of OpenCV library. It is the open source computer vision library some of you may not have used it, but if you're working in computer vision, I bet a lot of you have used this open source library and used it quite often in your daily work. So today I did one challenging thing that I downloaded the first version that goes to the public of, of, of OpenCV. It is actually the version of 0 0.97. And I would like to take you to look inside the OpenCV library with me together. So first, let's take a look at the authors of the OpenCV library. So here you can see it listed, the names of a group of people who have made great contributions to the OpenCV library, and most of them come from Intel. Actually, the story started that when our guy Gary, so at that time, he tried, when he tried to do some research work in computer vision, when he read some papers at that time, he found uh, a lot of papers at that time that didn't have source codes attached to it. And even for those research papers that did have uh, attached source codes, most of the source codes couldn't run on your own computer because everyone was writing their own code. But in MIT, 
they saw that uh, they have this Matonic platform that the researchers and students, they could use this one platform. They didn't need to reinvent the wheels, write everything from scratch. Instead, they could focus on the real problem. And so I think that motivated Gary and a lot of experts from Intel. So they worked together to put the first release of OpenCV to the market for the developers and researchers to use for free. And now you may have this pro, uh, question or problem that after 20 years of this first release, can I still run the same samples that were released in the first version? Can I still run that on my computer now? So today I provided you this demo to show you that even for the first version, although it's a bit challenging to run it on my current computer, but I still make it work. So you can see here, for this edge detection, it works just fine. And also for this contour example, you can still extract the contours from the images quite conveniently. And also um, when running the sample for drawing, you can do drawing on your computer screen very conveniently. Um, and another sample I would like to share with you, which I believe it's a very important a sample in the development of computer vision is that for this face detection sample. So it was quite important that at that time people found you can just use your own machine to run face detection on your compu computer with this open source library. And it really changed how people look at computer vision. And so for today, if you still look at the source codes in the first release version, you could see that most of the source codes, some of the source codes, they are still quite similar to what we are using today. And also for this while loop, I think I could still use it for today. And also you can find some very interesting comments in the first release that saying that this is not working at this time, but we, wouldn't, we will need, in, need to implement something in the future. So you can see when the first version of the open source library was released to the public, it was not perfect at that time, but it did provide an open source library that all people could use it. It's a start, it's a beginning with a lot of people downloaded use it. They could collaborate in it to make it better. So from those stories, what lessons have we learned? I think the very first important thing is that for open source project, we always strive for simplicity. We will not require each collaborators or developers to know every detail of the project, to know how to optimize it before they could even start to use it. Instead, we provide you a simple straight path that you can start to use it. And in this way, I think we provided a way to avoid uh, reinventing the wheels. So by unifying the fundamental building blocks into one open source library, the developers, they could, uh, they didn't need to write everything from scratch by their own. So instead they can really avoid being reinventing the wheels. And none of this would be successful without the open source community. So it is today in Intel, we still treat the open source concept it's a very important concept here at Intel. Well, then um, that's the story that I would like to share for the open source project. And now let's move on to talk about deep learning. As we know that deep learning is a subset of machine learning and that is a subset of AI. It is not a whole new topic, but it's been hard uh, just in recent, I, I think 10 or 12 years. So what happened, I think one thing contributes to this vast development of deep learning is the rich computing source we could now obtain. And also with a large number of training data we could obtain, we could use them to train the neural networks to get better result. So with, uh, I listed two charts here, you can see that uh, with the training goes on, the performance of the image recognition and speech recognition, at some point, it could, they could perform even better than human beings. So I think um, at Intel, we also see this opportunity. 
In the year of 2016, Intel acquired this company called Exceeds. It was actually founded by the same group of people who had made OpenCV a very big success. So when we put them together in 2018, we could release the first version of OpenVINO. So from name, you could see open just means open source and Vino means visual inference and neural network optimization. So OpenVINO was first targeted at computer vision, but now it has been, it could support uh, the natural language processing deep learning models. So from the lessons we have learned in the past, in OpenVINO, we have streamlined the workflow for our developers to use OpenVINO very simply and conveniently by just following these three simple steps, build, optimize, and deploy. You can start by building the deep learning models and then deploy, finally deploy them to your hardware systems. So next, let's take a look inside which uh, each of these three steps. So in first step, build. In OpenVINO, we provide you this open model zoo. It's actually contained a large number of pre-trained models because I think today for our AI developers, most of you don't like to write everything from scratch if you want to start training your deep learning models. So we have supported this pre-trained models. Either they could be trained by the um, TensorFlow AI frameworks or other Onyx, PyTorch, different AI frameworks we all supported. Actually, it's more important that we have supported more than 300 pre-trained models and we have tested, validated, and optimized those models for you. And it covers a wide range of deep learning tasks like um, object detection, semantic segmentation, human pose, estimation, and etc. Here, I would like to share uh, a simple uh, example for you. So if you want to do image classification, all you need to do is to pick the image classification model from our open model zoo, and you upload an image of your own, and then you can just let the pre-trained model to do the magic for you. So you can see in a very short period of time, the inference results could be provided back to you, like in this image, a banana with 99% of confidence has been detected. And even the wine glass in the background, which is a little blurry, could also be detected with 86% of confidence. And so for our second step, the optimize, which is a uh, model optimizer, which actually is the core of our offering. It consists a set of optimization tool, which could reduce your model size and also to reduce the latency with little degradation to the model accuracy. It support different optimization techniques such as quantization algorithms. And also it could be called by a, in different ways like command line to API or have, has already been included in our uh, deep learning workbench. And for the third step, the deploy, it actually provides you inference engine that could do inference and provide results on different hardware, uh, different multiple processors, accelerators, or different environments. So uh, we believe the approach like right once deploy anywhere. So with this approach, I think we could really use this inference engine to speeding up your deployment. So in a word, OpenVINO provides the developers a very simple journey that we pack the build, the optimize, the deploy into one pack for our developers to use. Um, actually, uh, I would like to share one of my previous experience that before uh, I joined Intel, actually I was doing this uh, AIoT uh, based solution, this project. When we try to deliver something to our customer, the first thing we need to find is the pre-trained models. We need to find the right, the, the, the right model for detection, for segmentation, to satisfy the accuracy requirements. Then with the uh, li limited budget, we need to find the right um, hardware, which uh, according to our previous design, we thought it should include CPU, VPU, or GPU to do all the inference. 
on, especially on the edge. And so we did a lot of work. It's quite painful when you try to uh, do this separately and to finally deliver them to your customers. But here with OpenVINO, now you can just use one pack of toolkit and to finish all these three tasks. And so with the high performance inference engine we provided and with this streamlined workflow we designed and with the approach of right ones deploy anywhere, we believe that OpenVINO could really bring business values to our AI developers. And speak of the compounding effect of software and hardware, for example, from the first to second generation of our Xeon processors to combining use with the deep learning uh, boosting neural network paired with our new releases of OpenVINO, now we could achieve three, 35 times faster of inference time. And also I think another important thing for our developers is the demo. Uh, actually, sometimes we call it demo is the king. In OpenVINO, we have provided our developers more than 35 demos to run so if you want to have an experience, first experience to see how OpenVINO works, you can just download these demos to see how OpenVINO works. So, okay, um, I've introduced so much about OpenVINO. So you may wonder, it looks, sometimes it looks too good to be true because I think most of the developers, when they try to develop an AI ecosystem, there are a lot of problems they would meet during the development, like um, the code just couldn't run on my computer. And there is this conflict of dependency to break my environment. I don't have a GPU card for the inference. So in OpenVINO, we also thought of that and we designed this, we provided this design of OpenVINO notebooks for our developers to have the first impression of how the OpenVINO works. It could be, uh, it was provided in Jupyter Notebooks that by using just one page of web page, when you run all the cells, you can see how in one scenario, OpenVINO can do the inference using one deep learning model. And to do that, what you need is just uh, a laptop or computer with CPU and the operating system we supported is Linux, Mac, or Windows, we all support it and you have Python 3 installed. Then by following these three simple steps, step one, you create and activate a virtual environment. Step two, you git clone the repository of the notebooks. And of course, if you're in China, it's more convenient for you to git clone from our GT resources. In the, in the third step, you can install and, uh, and load all the notebooks. Also here, I have a small demo for you to show that the notebooks could really be convenient and easy to, to, to load and open. Yeah, so in a nutshell, our OpenVINO toolkit not only support the virtual models trained by different AI frameworks, and also we provided its easy deployment over different hardware systems. And so normally, um, Sometimes if you change the inference of your deep learning model to different hardwares, you, you need to, sometimes you need to re-optimize it, reformat it, but in OpenVINO, we save you the effort that by only switch this, uh, this flag of device name, you can easily change the inference over different hardwares. And here for this image classification example, you could also see here, when you first upload an input image and you can select whichever hardware you, you're using and then in a short period of time, the result could be come back to you. So, so far OpenVINO, uh, we, have uh, we have had this collaboration with a lot of our ecosystem partners. So you may not have realized, but OpenVINO are really running in their back, uh, back end. And, and for this year, to enable more AI developers here local in China, our OpenVINO had this deep integration of Baidu Pedal Pedal. Um, as you know, Pedal Pedal is a Baidu open source deep learning framework. And, and with this 
establishing this profound partnership with Pedal Pedal, OpenVINO, and now supported up to 56 Pedal Pedal operators. And um, for, most, for most of the Pedal Pedal models, you could directly use OpenVINO to do the inference without need to change, to, to transform the Pedal model into any intermediate representation. So the streamline of workflow is even simplified. So we believe that with the in deep integration of Pedal Pedal and OpenVINO, we can co-create a new experience of really easy AI inference. So far, if you have not tried our OpenVINO, you are very welcome to download OpenVINO from our website. And also if you want to try to use the OpenVINO notebooks, it's also very welcome to download them from GitHub or GT. And at the same time, we provide you this Edge AI certification program. It is a well-designed course that provided you the AI background knowledge and also the introduction of our Edge AI techniques and also the detailed introduction of OpenVINO. Also, you are very welcome to register through this link. And okay, that's all my sharing for today. Thank you for your listening. If you have any questions and if you have uh, all the interesting things you would like to discuss, you're well, very welcome to reach out to me. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for Jojo's amazing interview. Uh, <clears throat> clear question from Lucas Yao. Uh, what, what hardware platform does open window support? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, he, he had a second question. Is uh, open window only used for, for computer vision? Uh, okay, okay. Thanks for Lok Siang's uh, great questions. Uh, the first is that OpenVINO has support different uh, hardware platforms uh, like Intel's uh, CPU, VPU, IGPU, and they all support it. And for the OpenVINO, it's not only useful for computer vision. So at first it was designed to uh, optimize for uh, computer vision, but now we have supported the NLP um, deep learning model. For example, the BERT has already been supported. Okay, uh, uh, a second question from Lin Wei. Uh, what are the advantages of OpenVINO over test RT? Uh, example performance. Um, actually, OpenVINO uh, supports the um, um, the TensorFlow uh, backend trained models, and we did some uh, optimization when we tested and validated these models. And there are some tr uh, there uh, there there has been a great lot of work for our engineers to. Uh, to do to have been um, carried out when we developed the uh, OpenVINO, uh, I, I think we we have some sort of comparison compar comparison for OpenVINO runtime. Uh, maybe I could find one to uh, provide this result later. Okay, uh, thanks for just the presentation. Uh, next, we are move the. Uh, last speaker, Stashin. Hello. Uh, hey, can you see me? Stashin. Okay. Uh, yeah. you, 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 you can start. You can start. All right. So um, let me share my screen first. I'll reset my. Mm. Wait. All right, can you guys uh, see my screen here? Yes, no problem. You guys hear me clearly. All right, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to give a short talk, like a brief 20 minute talk. Um, I am uh, part of the Mulevis project, Mulevis database project, and I'll be introducing that project to you guys and how Mulevis vector database being um, enabling a bunch of like AI application innovations and the other way around, how actually the, the AI open source communities being uh, enabling Mulevis and vector database.
base field. All right. So um, first, I will give a brief uh, introdu introduction of myself. Hey, I am uh, Sita Shen. I am a data engineer from Zillus. Uh, I'm a Milvus contrib contributor and a very active member of the Milvus community. If you happen to, to use Milvus, as you are in our Slack channel or anything, you probably you know, seen me before. <laughs> and um, Zillus is a company that's uh, behind Milvus and we're uh, the main contrib contributor of the Milvus vector database project. And I graduated from the Penn State University with a dual master's degree in industrial engineering and operation research. So my background is a good blend of applying mathematics and um, engineering. And I previously, I worked as a data scientist as well. So I work a lot with data-driven models and things like that. And although I can't really see your faces right now, but I would love to connect with each one of you. And um, you can connect with me via LinkedIn, you via that link, myname.com. So see that should dot com. That's gonna go to my LinkedIn page. So I will go first go over my agenda, what I'll be talking about uh, for this short talk. First, I will talk, the, talk about our motivation of building an open source vector database. So what is the kind of data movers is designed to deal with? Then I will go over Milvis database, where it fits in a typical machine learning pipeline. And what are, what are some of the features uh, uh, Milvis database has and what makes it special and what it supports, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll give a very short high level overview of the Milvis architecture uh, and some of the characteristics uh, it brings uh, to the whole system. And lastly, um, that's if I get through the three boring parts, um, that's the fun part. I'll spend majority of the presentation talk about you know, some real world use cases and some of them are extremely fun. <laughs> so uh, with the development advancements in data-driven models, especially in the last decade, in the emergence of deep learning, um, I'm gonna talk about how and why we believe that vector can be used as a source of data for database. Right, And before we go into Milvus and uh, vector database, we need to understand the problem we're, we're trying to solve. Uh, first, we look at, you know, on the left, we call those kind of structured data, right? The data with predefined patterns and values and be able to fit in a traditional relational database. And also extracting information features from those data tend to be relatively easier. Uh, we can do that with a deterministic mathematical approach or uh, like a traditional machine learning model. Machine learning algorithms uh, are sufficient most of the time. But moving on the right, <coughs> there is unstructured data like um, audio, image, social network, even 3D models. I'm working on a solution on that, 3D models. Those actually make up more than 80% of the data we deal with every day. Um, they have no set structures and they're not easy to store. Like, like the structure of unstructured data is always like proprietary, right? So it's very difficult to store multiple kinds of unstructured data in one database. And it's very difficult to organize and the complex structure gives, you know, the features are nonlinear. So um, <clears throat> extract information, extract features out of unstructured data tend to be very difficult. That requires a lot of computational power and, uh, <clears throat> and a proprietary algorithm to do something like that, right? And so for structured data, we can store them in a database, a relational database, but what the hell are we gonna do with unstructured data? But thanks to the advancement in data-driven models in the recent decade, there, I believe there is a proprietary solution for almost all, all, kind, all types of unstructured, unstructured data we deal with, right? There is a solution for image, a solution for audio, a solution for even 3D model. Now we're able to extract information from unstructured data using state-of-the-art deep learning models with very minimal information loss. And this, this process of extracting information, we also call it embedding. Right. And we can get embedding vectors, vectors out of the unstructured data. <clears throat> and with the, with the vectors, so we 
actually kind of transformed the problem of dealing with unstructured data into dealing with vectors. So how do we store vectors and how do we compute? How does vector computation work? And vectors are very different than the numbers. Numbers, you can do arithmetic operations like uh, addition, uh, like division and multiplication and things like that. But with vectors, the only thing you can do is their directions, right? Uh, vectors, vectors are actually like directions. The only thing you can probably do is, you know, similarity, right? You can do similarity comparisons. But and with numbers, you want to search a number. You can, this is an easy solution. You can build a binary tree, but with vectors, it's very different. And on the right hand side, uh, bottom, there are two kinds of uh, uh, indexes for vectors, and one is tree based, uh, one is uh, they're graph based and cluster based. And um, building index for, for vectors are done through approximate near neighborhood search. And uh, we're gonna go into that, all right? So um, vectors, vector indexes are done through approximate nearest neighborhood. And they are, tend to be quite complicated and uh, complex. But thanks to the open source community, there is a rich collection of index types available. And each type of index has its own characteristic and there's a solution for almost any kind of scenario out there. For example, uh, the graph based uh, HNSW kind of index, uh, that's very expensive to build and the index size is actually larger than the original data, but the search is very, is very fast, right? And uh, left to that phase is developed by Facebook. And um, the inverted file base in kind of index is very uh, versatile and, uh, and uh, it's kind of opposite to the, to the graph based uh, indexes. And because uh, we don't have much time here, I'm going to skip uh, the details. But if you're interested, you know, you can always reach out to me uh, via LinkedIn and uh, we can discuss. It's a fun topic. And then we can go into what is Milvis, right? So where does Milvis fit in a, a typical machine learning pipeline? Uh, on the blue, uh, the blue boxes, uh, blue operations is a training phase and the green, the green ones are uh, on production. So predicting like model serving. And with data flowing from some kind, some kind of data pipeline uh, in production, into a model serving framework. And that uh, model is powered by some, that model serving framework is powered by some trained machine learning model. Embedding can be, can be processed, can be created and stored in the vector database. And the, ve and the vector database should provide, in our belief, should provide basic functionalities like uh, of a database, like uh, data persistent, partition and sharding, as well as a blazing fast similarity search uh, functionalities. Here are some of the features of uh, the Milvis database. Uh, Milvis supports parallel computing natively and it supports, uh, you can accelerate the search, similarity search with NVIDIA GPUs uh, to speed up uh, the search and the index building process. And uh, it's, uh, it supports heterogeneous computing. So it supports a bunch of different hardwares. Uh, to be specific, most of the x86 instruction sets are, are supported. And as a database, a vector data is still a database, right? As a database, Milva supports basic, fu basic functionalities of a database, like uh, data persistence. It keeps the data safe and have recover, recovery uh, mechanisms, me mechanisms if the data is, uh, is, uh, is lost. Uh, it supports partition to help organize your data. It supports data sharding to better utilize uh, hardware resources. And it even supports uh, filtering before search. It's like a select in SQL to decrease computational cost of uh, the actual similarity search. And Milvis has adopted uh, a bunch of uh, state-of-the-art uh, similarity search algorithms like uh, like the indexes I described before, like phase, annoy, and HNSW. And it has a very versatile uh, 
uh, client, and it, it, it supports many development environments, including Python, C++, Java, and Go. And uh, the, the design of MuVis is completely cloud native. And you can easily deploy MuVis through Helm. And because the storage is based on mini IO and uh, is S3 native support, uh, supports S3 natively, and you can connect to basically any public cloud object storage uh, through mini IO. And MuVis is highly, scalable and elastic due to its architectural design. And I'll briefly talk about that uh, now, the architectural overview. And we believe that mm, the only architecture, the only architecture supporting storage and computer uh, and computing separation can scale on demand and take full advantage of cloud's elasticity. And we, I want, I really want to uh, kind of introduce you to the microservice design of Mulevis, and um, the log broker on the middle serves as a, the six, the system's backbone. All data inserts and updates operation must go through the log broker. So a worker node, when it executes any operation, uh, it consume, it subscribe to the log broker and consume log from there. So this design reduces system complexity and move the core functionalities like uh, data persistence into the storage layer, right? And makes the worker nodes and access layer, the proxies and the coordinator services completely, uh, completely stateless. So there's no data stored in there. And now go into this more in detail in the next slide. So this is a kind of an illustration of a log sequence pub sub uh, system. So uh, the log sequence is uh, powered by Kafka or Pulsar. Pulse, uh, we're going to support uh, both. And um, when you want to add a, add, a, add a worker node, you just let the worker node subscribe to the message stream and get, a, get data from there. And that makes failure very easy, worker node failure very easy to, to recover. And uh, thanks to open source community, thanks to Kafka and Pulsar, and we can guarantee in-memory data durability. And uh, it's also better positioned for future scaling. Uh, if you want to add another worker node, another kind of node, you just let it subscribe to the log sequence and that's it. And it really reduces the system's complexity. It gives uh, the system very high availability and horizontal scalability. And enough of the, the architectural and uh, numbers and things. Let's uh, look at some uh, real world use cases, right? So uh, Mulevis has a quite big of a community. Uh, I think we open source around two years ago. And after 10,000 commits, we have accumulated 8.5 uh, case, uh, eight and a half thousand stars on GitHub. But I think more importantly, we have helped more than a thousand users uh, with their project. And uh, actually hundreds of them already put Milwis into production. Now let's look at uh, some of the fun ones, right? Wait, okay, here we go. So the first one is a real estate technology company. Uh, it's, like a, it's, it's like a Zillow of China. Right, and uh, you log in there, you can browse uh, different properties and it's gonna recommend new properties to you. And they have four kinds of data. And they have floor plan, area, outline, and orientation, right? And they use some kind of data-driven model to extract four sets of embedding vectors from these four source of data. And they created four uh, collections. Uh, they are kind of like tables. Uh, in Milvis, and Milvis performs a similarity search to find the closest result for each one of them. And then the results of the similarity searches, all four of them are congregated and the closest property are returned as uh, the recommended property. And I think one special thing about this project is that it only took six people one month to launch the project from POC to prototyping, actual coding, testing, at, put into production only a month. And they used our uh, Python SDK. Uh, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite simple to do. 
And the second one is uh, with images. Uh, the computer vision has been blowing up since uh, like 10 years ago, right? And this is a, I think one of the biggest museums in the United States. And um, <clears throat> they're trying to combine technology and art to increase uh, people's interest in fine arts. And uh, you, basically what they built is you can upload one of your own picture or image or photo of yourself. And it's gonna go through their database and they're gonna find the closest, the most similar fine art to the image that uh, you provided. And uh, the way they did that is uh, they used two neural networks in series. <clears throat> so uh, to create embeddings for image. The first one is uh, YOLO, it's object detection. They fine tuned it for their, for their use, for their database, for their data, data set. And then it goes, uh, it goes into a, a fine tuned ResNet and it creates uh, embeddings. <clears throat> and this actually, this product is launched. Uh, it's called uh, Art, Art Lens AI. And you guys can check it out. It's, 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 it's quite fun, right? And the next one is a product recommendation. Uh, this user is, I think one of the, not one of the biggest e-commerce company in Indonesia. And uh, they previously rely on Elasticsearch to search uh, the re relevant pro uh, products. Uh, they need a updated system. And uh, Elasticsearch, uh, they were using Elasticsearch to search for exact keywords. But the exact keywords are words doesn't really mean what they appear to be, right? It has no, if you match raw text, it doesn't have any semantics in there. And uh, so they started using some machine learning. Uh, they, they were using, uh, they're using in, uh, a word to vec encoder uh, to create embeddings for their product, their the product category and the description, and then feed that into Milvis for search. And uh, the result, the end result is time, time, 10 times faster uh, query performance and uh, like a hell of uh, higher recall and uh, better uh, like user satisfactory. And then this user is one of the biggest tech giants in China and they're doing a music recommendation. Actually, I was, I was actually a professional jazz player before I started college. And uh, for music, it's, it's, the melody doesn't really contribute that much to the, to the sentiment of the music. It's more about the chord progression and uh, the rhythm, right? Once the chord progression and rhythm is set, the overall sentiment doesn't really change that, that much with a different melody. So the first thing they did was strip uh, the melody of the, the original music, right? And uh, uh, strip the, the melody of the original music and only leaving the background music and use that to, uh, to create embeddings. They use some kind of data-driven models to create binary embeddings for, uh, for the music pieces and use Milvus to search. And uh, they, I think, I don't think they're in production yet, but it's production ready. And uh, their data scale is around multi-million. And lastly, it's a pharmaceutical company. Uh, a major product that involves Milvis is pharmaceutical molecular analysis application. That's a little, in my opinion, a little different from the rest of the example. Uh, because the core business value comes from Milvis itself. Molecular similarity search is important because researchers can discover how a molecular will react to a certain medicine uh, based on how similar uh, molecule, molecules react. Uh, this application works by encoding molecular formulas as uh, uh, thousand, uh, two to the 10th uh, binary vectors. With these vectors storing Milvis, uh, they are able to do a really fast uh, similarity search on a single machine. I think their uh, benchmark is around um, for 800 million data uh, on a single machine, uh, one query 
similarity search takes less than 0.5 seconds. That's a 1200 fold uh, performance increase uh, compared to their previous uh, uh, solution, which is using a Spark cluster and do a brute force search. And uh, I'm approaching the end of my presentation. I've spent a very long time, you know, talking about how Mule has been enabled a bunch of like AI, AI applications, AI, AI innovation. But I think it's also important to address what is enabling vector database and Milvis. Although we're the one, Milvis is the one that's currently luckily uh, leading one of the leading projects in the field of vector database. But I don't think that we're enabling uh, vector database. It's the, the open source, uh, the AI open source community. Uh, thanks to the countless scholars, engineers, math mathematicians, and um, data scientists, and their hard work on uh, like deep learning algorithms makes everything possible. Like without them, without the open source community, uh, none of these would be even possible. All right, so uh, this is the end of my uh, presentation. Do you have any question you can post in the chat? Uh, so that's that. Yes. Here are two questions from Jose. Uh, yes. We go, we give all the chance to Jose. Uh, the first question is, how many enterprise have user, have uses Mimis? The second, as a startup, <clears throat> how to earn money through open source projects such as Mimis? Um, uh, I, I didn't quite get the second one, but I'll, I'll respond to the first one first. Um, so there are a, a, an estimate of over a thousand users, but for our recording, we already recorded more than 700. We have 700 enterprise users reach out to us and, uh, you know, they're using Mulevis. And uh, hundreds of them are using Mulevis in a production environment already. And the rest of them are still uh, proof of concept. So what was the second question again? Uh, uh, no question, no, no, no. Uh, let, me, let me actually check. Uh, okay, uh, there are no any questions. So uh, that's uh, for that very interesting talk. <clears throat> and, uh, I would like to expand my thanks to all the speakers for the excellent pre presentation and for the discussion. I hope all of you get some inspirations from their talks. With that, we will be concluding and I'd like to remind you that after today's session, there are two more sessions of the series of four. The next session, uh, will be AI in 5G towards a new telecommunication era. Will take, uh, will take place on 11th of November. And then on the 9th of December, the last session, uh, Live with AI, past, present, and future. Uh, please stay tuned and check the two sessions on AI for Good website. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Genevieve and Sita and all the other great speakers today uh, and the audience for asking lots of great questions. It was a very interesting session. Uh, we are now opening a quick poll with one question. Please answer and let us know how much you liked this session. Uh, we also encourage you to check out the AI for Good program online to see which sessions may be of more interest to you or of interest to you, uh, including the ones uh, that were mentioned earlier in this series with ZTE. For example, uh, in the immediate future, next week we have webinars on many topics such as robotics and climate science. We are posting some links in the chat and encourage you to join then. You can also rewatch this session on our AI for Good YouTube channel and share it with your friends and colleagues. With that, we have reached the end of this webinar and would like to once again thank everyone involved, our panel, participants, partners, sponsors, and co-convener Switzerland.
Thank you very much, and we hope to see you again soon.